I'm gonna be up front with you guys. I didn't like Tiny Toons as a kid. <laughs> yeah, I know. What little I watched of it as a kid didn't hold my attention, and there was a lot of things that really annoyed me. And honestly, the theme song was one of them. I'm sorry, the intro's not good. It's one of those cartoons that makes it too obvious you're watching a kid show. I know I'm gonna get massive amounts of shit for all that, but I gotta be honest, you know? And of course, that was all when I was a kid. Now, I respect what it did, what it broke ground in and everything. It's a well-written show with well-written jokes, but to me, Tiny Toons will always be the cartoon that laid the groundwork for Animaniacs. That's the cartoon I liked. I thought it was just written so much better, and the uh, jokes were a little bit more mature. Not very much more, but it's, it was just different. With that said, I'm a dumb ass because Tiny Toons was part of a lot of people's lives and it was extremely successful. Successful enough that there was a slew of video games made for it. If it was a major 8 or 16-bit console, it probably had a Tiny Toons game. And there was a very high chance it was made by Konami. Man, I really miss when Konami was cool. I think they've been shit for so long, now there's people who have grown up playing video games who have never seen a good Konami game. Now I go to casinos and I see Konami branded slot machines, and I'm like, fuck, I didn't want to bet a hundred. Give me my fucking money back, you piece of shit. But yeah, Konami made a whole bunch of these games, and I was lucky enough to actually own some of them as a kid. I probably owned them because there weren't any good Bugs Bunny games. Or was there a future video? But let's go ahead and rapid fire this shit, knock them out quick. Let's do Tiny Toon Adventures on the NES. I didn't have this game as a kid, but after playing it, I kind of wish I did. It's not bad. Montana Max has kidnapped Babs Bunny and is going to feed her to a giant shark. What I say about the giant shark? I said no giant shark. And the rest writes itself. Basically what you got is a pretty Mario inspired side scroller. You can get a heart which gives you an extra hit just like the mushroom. Buster can run pretty damn fast. So fast in fact it's hard to see what's going on. Or maybe my play ends as bad as my reflexes slow. We got a picture of Plucky Duck down here on the bottom. Now, what's that about? Well, at the beginning of the game, you can choose a second character to play as. Plucky, Dizzy, or Furball. Plucky can glide by tapping the jump button. Dizzy can speed! And Furball can do kind of a wall jump. I ended up being Furball the most because the wall jump lets you be a scumbag and cheat a lot of the level. So, on my first playthrough of this, I got through the second stage, I went through this door, and then Elmira shows up, and I figure, okay, she's a boss. I'll jump on her head. And what's this? Oh, I'm dead? Oh, I guess you can't jump on her head. Despite the fact that this game has been teaching me to jump on enemy heads. All right, no biggie. I'll just try again. Oh, we're back at the character select screen. I mean, okay. I mean, I'll select somebody, I guess. Okay, apparently I don't have this footage recorded, but it sent me back to the first stage. And no, I didn't game over. Let's look at the footage again. I clearly had three lives. I didn't game over. Apparently, if Elmira catches you, she takes you back to the first stage of the level. Let me go ahead and put another bullet in my Russian roulette gun. So I go back to this quote-unquote boss fight, and I'm just jumping around going, oh shit, oh shit, what am I supposed to do? What am I supposed to do? It won't let me do anything. I can't jump on her head. What am I supposed... Uh-huh. So you're just supposed to avoid her until the exit pops up. Does that make any sense? Nope, nope. Hey, check out what passes as a boo in this game. It's the pumpkin-headed guy from Monster Party. Don't pick on him. Well, it turns out Elmira wasn't the boss. This is the boss, Gene Splicer, on a freaking skateboard. And guess how you take her out? You jump on her fucking head. Make up your mind, game. At least if she kills me, I can start back over. It doesn't put me at the first level again. The boss really isn't all that hard. It just took me for a ride that Elmira can't be jumped on the head, but this thing can. This game has the most bipolar rules. The only boss I really had any real trouble with was this monkey. You're not supposed to attack him directly. You're supposed to kill all his children. That's metal. And every time you do that, somehow that makes a block of his platform go down. Hmm, making platforms disappear to make a monkey fall down. Now, where have I heard that before? Oh, that's right. I fell off a ladder yesterday cutting limbs. I'm okay, but I'm bleeding out of one eye. Here's the only part in this entire game that thoroughly pissed me off. You're supposed to go up this elevator while a bunch of not bullet bills violently gang rape you with bullets. I can safely say if I was playing this on a real NES, there is no fucking way I could have done this part. So I have nine lives and I did die nine times. And when you game over, you go back to three lives and I died six more times. So this would have taken three 
three game overs before I finally would have got this. And that's assuming I don't die in any other part of the game in the first of the last level. Which is actually pretty aggravating too because you have these night guards that throw shit at you and the lights keep going on and off. I did beat Montana Max, the final boss, and that might actually be the easiest boss in the game. And this ending shows you how much inspiration they got from Super Mario 3, you know, with the curtain and everything. And that's the first Tiny Toons game. Not too bad. Now, I didn't have that game as a kid. I had the second one. The second one is Trouble in Wacky Land. This is the NES Tiny Toons that I'm familiar with. I had this. The story goes that an amusement... Wait, wait, what? Why? Whoa, whoa, whoa. Is that what I think... It is. Oh, fuck me in the ass. Okay, y'all, don't worry about it. I'm a pro. I know how to deal with this. I'll fix this. Boom, fixed. So an amusement... <laughs> I gotta take it off, I'm sorry. <laughs> an amusement park got built in Acme Acres, and Buster gets an invite to it. But it's owned by Montana Max, who's put a bunch of traps in the rides because bad guy. On this one, you've got a stage select, and all but one of the stages is already unlocked for you. You need tickets to get on the rides, and that's what counts as your lives in the game. You can get more tickets by going to the ticket booth. The way you get tickets is by getting points. And you get those points by doing basically anything in the game. It sounds complicated, except it doesn't, and it's not. To get to the final stage of the Funhouse, you need either 50 normal tickets or what they call gold tickets, and you get those gold tickets by completing a stage. Now, here's the beauty part. You can get these gold tickets more than once on a stage, so you don't necessarily have to play every single stage, which is great because I fucking hate the roller coaster level. I might as well show you this one first because it's the worst one. Get it? Worst is first. I rhymed. It's funny. Laugh, damn it! You stand on the platform and try not to hit anything, but you need lightning fast reflexes, and before you know it, you're dead as a hammer. Do you know how dead a hammer is? Well, it's not alive, is it? It's dead. You're dead. Dead as the hammer, because the hammer is dead. That's all I'm going to say about the roller coaster level. All you do is die. I hate it. Next level. You know what? No, I'm not done. They give you the ability to flip over so you can dodge more shit, but you don't get the choice of which way you flip. Sometimes you'll flip left, sometimes you'll flip right. It depends on which way you're going. Notice how I keep showing you the same spot in the game. It's because this is where I keep dying. There's two enemies, there's two blocks in the way, and there's two blocks on the bottom there. Well, that's just too much damn shit to keep track of when you're going 100 miles a damn hour. If you get through this fucking stage without any save stuff, States, pat yourself on the fucking back, dude. This is some I wanna be the tune shit. The next level is one where you're furball on a water slide level. It's almost the same premise as the roller coaster level, except it is a lot easier. Memorize everything that's coming at you and don't get hit. There's also a little elevator platform thing where you just go up and down, up and down, and try not to get hit by anything. And I swear, I don't know if I just suck, but I think there's just one spot where you just have to take the hit. The hitbox on these spikes is kind of odd. Or maybe I just suck. That's very possible. Then you're Hampton on top of a moving train trying to take out bad guys. And no, you cannot jump on their heads. But you do have this awkward kick that works pretty good. This one's not too hard. The only thing that'll really fuck you over in it is sometimes the train will uncouple while you're in the tunnel. And if you don't know that, next thing you know, you're on a midnight train going nowhere. This level actually has a boss. He pops out of the train and you hit him like whack-a-mole. Nothing to it. It. Bumper cars, you hit the other rats into the hole and that's it. Except that's not it and it sucks. Every single thing that you touch in this level will knock you all over the place. You get your ass beat up enough, you lose all control and then you're just a headless chicken. You know they still live with their head cut off? On the second stage, do not go on this bottom level. You will not come out. You hit one damn wall down here and the ride begins, boy. I push every button on my PS3 controller taking the place of an NES controller and I I cannot control this thing for shit. More than once, I've actually won these stages out of dumb luck. It's not that they're hard, they're just aggravating. The final level, the fun house, is where shit gets real, though. Now it's a lot more like the original Tiny Toons game. And like its final level, they keep fucking with the lights. Doesn't seem all that hard at first glance, though. The music is kind of kick-ass in this level, too. A 
as awesome as this music sounds, it does kind of sound out of place in a Tiny Toons game when you think about it. The final level has a little bit of a maze thing going on with a bunch of doors that lead to random areas and sometimes even loop back to where you just came from. And sometimes your ass goes upside down. If you hawked a loogie, would it go on the floor or the ceiling? For that matter, what counts as ceiling and what counts as floor? Maybe it's a fleeling. This part is pretty neat. You could kill the enemies that are right side up while you're upside down. But then the cool factor goes away when you get to this part right here. I try to jump here. It doesn't work. I try to jump there. It doesn't work. I duck down to see if there's a crawl function and no, there isn't. I do everything short of the fucking hokey pokey and turn my ass around. Finally, I give up and get the manual out and it tells me I have to dash and slide. I didn't even know you could dash, let alone slide, but there you go right there. I gave up on this game as a kid because I got stuck on this exact part. Now I feel like a fucking idiot. Elmira is back and does she take you back to the overworld with just one hit? I didn't stick around to find out. You get to Montana Max, he throws bombs at you, you throw the bombs right back at him and that is it. I gotta say, I appreciate this game now more than I did then. Now to never play it again, again. There's one more on the NES, and it's more of a program than it is a game. It's like Mario Paint, kind of. Cartoon Workshop. The game gives you a bunch of backgrounds, animations, scenes, all kind of shit to make your own cartoons. And I gotta say, the interface was painfully slow. It took me forever to just make one cartoon. I'm gonna pick this guy. He looks like me. All right, we're placing our little coyote dude in the scene. Wait a minute, wait, wait, wait. You know what this reminds me of? Spider-Man Cartoon Maker. <laughs> Okay, Reggie, my movie is ready. Guys, this is going to be the movie that will surpass Revenge of the Mad Madman. The blue shell incident, that's kitty shit. This is the real shit. Witness my new feature film, The Rainbow Effect. Okay, I'm full of crap. You can't change the music. You know what upsets me most about this movie? YouTube will probably flag this as for kids. They don't understand my vision. They don't understand my drive to make film, to make plucky hump babs in the fucking face. Okay, I admit this is extremely wrong and I'm going to quit showing this now. Shoutouts to my dad who watches my videos and just had to see a duck and rabbit fuck each other. Now we see Buster doing a classic southern tradition called shoot fish in the face with a gun. That's all of that game I can stand. Now you've seen the Tiny Toon Adventure games on the NES, but there are more. Oh, there are so much more games. And the good news is some of them are actually good. But for now, we're going to put Tiny Toons on the back burner, and we're going to go somewhere else. Somewhere awful. Next time you tune in to Working Man Games, we are going to the cesspool of the gaming industry. The place franchises go to die. A seedy, shady, accursed hellhole. One that sucks all money and sucks all ass. The very mention of this type of game strikes anger and fear into the heart of the common gamer. The act of even stepping foot in this hard, atrocious excuse of a game genre 100% guarantees the loss of any resemblance of respect your fan base may have had for your games. Hitler begs for fucking mercy at the very sight of these abominations. Angry video game nerd writes a cease and desist note because I'm starting to sound too much like him right now. You may already know the genre I'm talking about. The one we all know of, but never speak of. Well, we're going there, kids. We're going to play mobile games. Alrighty then, kiddos. Did you enjoy that? God, I hope you did. 
If you didn't, then you probably didn't even make it this far. So I'm just going to assume if you made it this far, you liked the video. Well, guys, I had no idea it had been this long since I had put out a Working Man episode, and I want to highly apologize for that. I'm going to be a lot more frequent, I promise. I've got something really special planned for April Fool's Day. If you're a leftover subscriber from my YouTube poop days, you might enjoy it. That said, I've got a mess load of episodes lined up. I just need to get off my ass and do them. I mean, heck, I've got time now, what with us being all cooped up in the house. In other news, I am highly considering starting up a Patreon, but I want to hear from you guys. If I start up a Patreon, what would you expect to see from me? I want to give patrons, like, early access to uploads. I want to do a Discord server and shoutouts at the end of the video, all that good stuff. So, yeah, if you want more information on it, I've got two Twitters going right now. I've got the Working Man Games Twitter, and I've got my personal Twitter. I'm Stuart K. Riley. My coffee page will stay open for people who don't want to commit to a monthly thing. They just want to give of like just a couple of bucks as a donation one time but if you're interested i'm starting up a patreon so there'll be a link for it soon that said if you're completely new here hey how the fuck are you doing man maybe you want to click all that bullshit all us youtubers tell you to click on if you subscribe to me i will give you uh uh oh this bag of cheez it's it's full it's all yours dude I keep getting recommended this on Facebook Marketplace. Are they trying to tell me something? In 1969, CBS had a TV show on their channel called The Archie Show by Filmation about the characters of the Archie comics forming a rock band. It was so successful that the show even had a number one hit on the charts. Now, what does this have to do with Scooby-Doo, you ask? Hold up, hold up, just stay with me, all right? CBS wanted to double down on that successful idea and asked Hanna-Barbera to make a similar show, only this time the rock band solves mysteries. Joe Ruby and Ken Spears would come up with The Mysteries 5, a show with a large sheepdog character that was a beatnik that played the bongos. That was fucking stupid, so they made Scooby-Doo instead. Scooby-Doo is one of those cartoons that refuses to die. It's as if it's always been around since the dawn of time. Other than a brief disappearance in the 90s, there has almost always been new episodes of Scooby-Doo in some form or another. And in the 2000s, we saw a huge revival in the series in the forms of movies, straight-to-video movies, reboots, and video games. Even though there were several games in the early 2000s, there were games before then. Games like... Mattel Electronics presents... Okay, it doesn't do that. Here's what it really sounds like. Well, that's five years worth of wax that just melted out of my ear canals. Okay, where do I begin? You see that puke green blob right there? That's supposed to be Scooby. And these are ghosts. Now, if Pac-Man has taught us anything, it's to avoid the ghosts, right? No! You touch the ghosts to win! Not only is that the polar opposite of Pac-Man, it's even in a maze, but this is the polar opposite of what Scooby would do in this situation. Unless he's doped up on whatever's in those Scooby snacks. And what kind of crazy person runs around touching ghosts anyway? Much less a dog. This game is simple. You move around, you touch ghosts, and you avoid a skull head that will chase you if he sees you. You can make him stop by laying a bone in the maze, and that's the whole game. Now, would you believe that this game will only work on a reel in television if you have the extremely rare ECS keyboard attachment? Yes, you heard me. This game requires a keyboard. Was there not enough buttons on the Intellivision keypad? Well, we can rule out this one getting re released least on the Intellivision Amico. How is that coming, by the way? Now, unfortunately, there was no NES Scooby-Doo. The series skipped it entirely. However, there were home computer releases, like Scooby-Doo on the Commodore 64. Hell yeah, we about to hear some sick banging Keychin remix of the Scooby-Doo theme? <laughs> Oh, that's not good, actually. Come on, man. I want to hear some nasty sizzling C64 sound chip goodness. You know what? I'll do it myself. what I'm talking about. Now, I don't claim to know everything about the show, but I'm pretty sure Scooby isn't yellow. Unless it's an episode I ain't seen. And Scooby grew some fucking balls in this game because he's punching ghosts in the face. Yeah, buddy.
It's not even that much of a punch. It's more like he's waving his fist up and down. You know how a lot of these home computer games are unbeatable because the game devs didn't really give a shit? I think this is one of those. Because for one thing, they put way too many enemies in here and you die in one hit. And if there's an enemy close to you, you can't run away from it because it walks just as fast as you. See, I'm fucking screwed right here. If I turn around, I die. And that's pretty much all you do in the game. Punch, ghosts, get trapped, and die. What you're supposed to do is find one of the other characters, then you go to the next stage. But good luck finding them without infinite lives. This is Captain Claw levels of unmerciful. What are these enemies supposed to be? Is that Adolf Hitler's head on a jack-in-a-box in a flower pot? I want to see the Scooby-Doo episode he's from. And what is that? What is that? <laughs> What is that supposed to be? It looks like a blow-up doll of a cheap chomp that got deflated. Uh, I think I've had enough of this game for a lifetime. There was another home computer game called Scooby-Doo and Scrappy-Doo. And just to change things up, we're gonna play it on the Atari ST. Huh. That's what I'm talking about. I think we in for some sick beats, boys. So this one's more of a 2D platformer like you would expect on the NES or something like that. And as far as I know, this is the only game you can play as Scrappy on, which is amazing. I wish they would have put this on NES or something. I would have killed to play a Scrappy-Doo game. Man, my childhood nostalgia is just flaring up so much seeing this. And you know what? What? Why are you looking at me like that? What, you don't like Scrappy? You don't think Scrappy's cool? I love Scrappy. He's awesome. I, I don't know what's wrong with y'all. Shit. Don't like Scrappy. What the fuck? Well, love him or hate him, this game doesn't seem to be all that bad. What I don't like is there's no visual cue of any kind that you've taken damage. You just take damage. And I don't think there's post-hit invincibility either. You attack your enemies with a boxing glove, and I think you can jump on some enemies' heads, but it doesn't really tell you which ones you can. Maybe it says in the manual, but of course I don't have that. I would like a sound effect, some flashing, some knockback, something to tell me I'm losing hell. But no, there's no sound effects at all, just this sick chiptune music. Which I'm not gonna lie, sounds pretty damn good. I kinda wonder if the Amiga version sounds better because there was one. Let's check it out. Oh, fuck, I could listen to that all day. Shit. I found this pogo stick in one level. I think it makes you jump higher, but other than that, it doesn't really help at all. In fact, it makes it to where you can't use your boxing gloves, so it's kind of like shit. I notice sometimes when you die in a place that has a lot of platforms, especially moving ones, it'll knock you back pretty damn far. I don't know what's up with that. Oh, shit, what's this level? Scrappy-Doo goes to hell? And then he Chris Redfield's a fucking boulder. Oh, who's this supposed to be? Is that Joe or Mac? You know, they show Scooby on the map and they show Scooby on the HUD, but I never actually see him in the game. How do you have a Scooby game without Scooby? But we sure got plenty of googly-eyed frogs and whatever the hell this is. Oh, wait, it's supposed to be a mammoth. I see now. You know what I thought it was? I thought the white part was a mouth and it was a big face going, oh! You know what? I keep making fun of this game, but it's actually pretty solid. I'm actually surprised an Atari ST game would be this good. You know, it's still bothering me, y'all don't like Scrappy. I think it's just y'all don't understand what he's been through in life. Scooby's sibling threw him away to live with him because he was unwanted. And then through his life, he conquered the Arctic Circle, escaped hell, and defeated a tribe of missing nose in a haunted forest. Yeah, the game glitched out on me and wouldn't play anymore after this. Oh, well, next. Scooby-Doo on the Super Nintendo. Oh, boy. I have got a love-hate relationship with this one. It's got a lot of things it does right. Like, the music is the background music from Scooby-Doo, Where Are You? And most of the sprites of Scooby and the gang are traced from animations on the show. Like, when Shaggy and Scooby walk, it's the same animation. It has the look and the sound, but how about the gameplay? How about... 
It's not your normal platformer. It's more of a glorified scavenger hunt. You wander around the map searching for clues like a blind man in a snake pit trying to eat spaghetti. You give the clues to Velma to unlock more areas in the level. Now, here's problem number one with that. Some of these clues are hidden, and to find them, you have to hold the X button to have Scooby sniff the area you're walking on to find something. This means that you have to go around sniffing every corner of the map to find hidden items, and Shaggy walks slower when you're sniffing. This can become a problem when you're in a place that has enemies in it. You see that? That's a scare meter. You fill that shit up and Scooby and Shaggy start having Vietnam flashbacks and you lose a life. There's no visual or audible feedback from you touching an enemy other than the gauge going up. There's no temporary invincibility or anything. You can literally just brush by an enemy and fill up half your damn gauge. It's aggravating. So how do you get it back down? You eat Scooby Crack, which Daphne gives you every time you unlock a new area. Guys, never Google Scooby-Doo Crack Pipe. You are not ready for what you will find. So do you have any way to attack, you ask? Each level gives you different weapons. Most of them are throwing weapons, but you also get a hammer and a trolley? Okay. The throwing weapons are poo-poo. If you actually hit anything with these things, it's pure luck. Oh, come on. Oh, for God's sake. Just hit the fucking jack o lantern my God. Piece of shit game. Oh, fuck your mother. You see, you have to time this just freaking right. Are you serious? Oh my God, come on. There! Fuck! But the main thing I hate about this game is that it's glitchy. Every time I played this game as a kid, I would find some kind of game-breaking glitch that would have to make me reset. In fact, I had one on this playthrough. At the end of the level, you had to find the items needed to make a trap, and then you lure the enemy into it. So I found the monster, and now it's supposed to chase me. But then I noticed it didn't follow me. The monster is stuck. And for some reason, Daphne spawned here. And also, there's a clue here that I've already got. Well, since all this monster is going to do is reverse moonwalk, I guess we got to end this review. Two out of ten. I liked this game as a kid, but not now. Scooby-Doo on the Genesis is a completely different game. It's a point-and-click game. I hate point-and-click games. Next! Scooby-Doo Classic Creep Capers on the Nintendo 64. Oh, this game made me want to shove my cock in a meat grinder. Oh, I don't remember this part of Resident Evil 2. That's right, we got fixed camber bang bubbles. This game follows the plot of episodes from the series. So we're outside the museum from the Black Knight episode. Is Shaggy gonna swoosh right in? No, he doesn't. That's disappointing. Not as disappointing as this fucking game, though. There is something bad wrong with the controls in this game. I don't even know how to describe it. Okay, basically, when you're walking and the game changes screens, it also changes how the control stick is set up. Like when you walk downward on the next screen, the position you have the stick on will now serve as the forward direction until you let the stick go. Then it resets. Imagine if you had a joystick that would randomly change which way is up. Man, you would just have to play it, and I'm telling you not to. It just about makes the game unplayable. It really turns into a problem when the Black Knight is chasing you because you lose track of what is what on the control stick. This is a Scooby-Doo game, a baby game. It doesn't need cryptic controls. And then there's this part where you have to dodge a bunch of dinosaurs. Oh God, I'm getting a headache just looking at this. It doesn't help that because of the fixed camera angle, you can't really make out the perspective of like how far or how close it is. And even when you can, you still have to fight the fucking controls. I mean, look at this. This is a mess. When you finally do make it to the end of this, you get to Velma and Velma says she needs you to find her glasses. So you have to get back out of this spot, go to the place where the Black Knight spawns, try to run away from him and then get to where the glasses are. Here's the problem. The Black Knight runs really fast and here you are trying to fight the controls. When I finally do to get to the glasses, the Black Knight gets over there too. And I got to use post hit invincibility to try to push myself away from him. 
but that doesn't work so i have to like inch around this corner and try to move him in such a way that i can get behind him but that tactic was about as reliable as a bethesda game this time i pick up the glasses as soon as he spawns that way he's still behind me and i can run away from him oh i made it but you know what i gotta do now go through the dinosaurs again oh for god's sake man to whoever made this level i hope their dog dies in a car crash and the dog was driving now i know the question you're gonna ask can you pick up velma's glasses before you meet her no they don't spawn i already tried that the fucking devs were adamant that you go through this place several times you know i'm from louisiana and in the south part of it we've got voodoo queens and witch doctors and shit i ought to commission one of them to make a scooby-doo voodoo doll that i could just steadily stick pins and needles in ah, fucking game devs ah your mama ah so you want to see the rest of this game well too bad because my emulator crashed i've never been happier that a program crashed in my life. Scooby-Doo and the Cyber Chase on PlayStation. My God, this one was not bad, actually. I mean it, after all the junk I just played, this was like playing Crash Bandicoot or something. If you've never seen the movie Scooby-Doo and the Cyber Chase, it's about the gang getting sucked into a video game. So, of course, there needs to be a video game, and here it is. I've spread my evil virus all over this game. Oh, this must be De Novo and I cheat. Come on, Daphne, let's go find that trap. Good luck, everyone. Saving your game is always a good idea when there's a phantom virus around. I love it when games can't decide on the sample rate for their audio. So the quality keeps going back and forth. Uh, Shaggy, what are you doing there? You doing push-ups? Like, drop down and give me 20, Scoob. What's your rager malfunction? It looks like you've landed in Japan. Kawaii. <laughs> well, when I said this is like playing Crash Bandicoot, I meant it. These levels are laid out exactly the same way. Watch out for those ninjas, Scooby. They look mean. Thank you for interrupting, Daphne. Now, you have jumping and ground pounding, but you've also got pies, which... I know you're hungry, Scooby, but these pies aren't for eating. You'll want to throw them at enemies when they get in your way. Can we not do this? I did this in the Grinch episode, and it wasn't funny then. Those Scooby snacks sure look good. Picking up more than one Scooby snack in a row. When you come to large gaps in the... Use your jump and bounce move to open... Like you fucked up, Scoob. So you have pies that you throw at enemies. How very cartoony. And you get the pies by ground pounding on these crates that look like Game Boys that only have a directional pad. Have you ever seen the No Buttons Twitter? This is like halfway there. But yeah, you jump, you ground pound, you throw pies, you defeat bosses, and then some. And that's pretty much the whole game. Honestly, it's not that bad for a Crash Bandicoot ripoff. The levels do feel samey sometimes, but the controls ain't too bad. The game isn't challenging, but it's not too easy either. It's, just a, it's a solid 7 out of 10, I would say. And then the ice levels! And it all comes crumbling down like my crypto when Elon Musk makes a tweet. Guys, how do y'all feel about a level where half the fucking floor is slippery? I just want to find the person that came up with the idea of slippery floors and just choke the fucking life out of them. Oh, I'm choking my microphone. What the fuck? How long did it take to make these textures for this level, I wonder? Look at me, I'm a graphic designer. I have never wanted to kill defenseless baby seals more than after playing this game. Anybody ever watch The Secret of the Seal? That was my first anime. Go tell Mr. Nani that I mean Nani that I mean Nani. I don't think anything. Ooh, let me tell you about this snowmobile level, though. I guess to make it more icy, they decided to make the controls of this thing really floaty. You can hang up doing any precision turning on this. Just hold on for dear life and don't hit anything till you get to the end. You know, that's good life advice. It seems all well and good until you get to this really narrow path with bottomless pits on both sides. Because this thing is so floaty, it's really easy to overcorrect and fall off the side. Oh, well, I guess I'll get fucked then. You're already trying not to hit this penguin, so you got two things to worry about at one time. And for some reason, when you hit this ramp, it'll send you flying in a random direction. <laughs> you know what I'm doing right there? Save stating. You know what? This boss fight can fuck right off. You're on a slippery block of ice with bottomless pits all around. You only have to hit the boss three times, but it's not hitting him. It's him hitting you you gotta worry about. The game tells you when you're able to hit the boss, and you better be ready. But you're not. You're slipping, sliding around, trying to get back in control again. And then he starts doing this fucking spin attack that's almost impossible to dodge. 
You would have an easier time trying to dodge jizz when you're stuck between a cock and a condom. That is probably somebody's fetish I just described. I did finally beat him, but I killed many a shaggy doing so. Okay, Doom Zombie. This final boss, however, is unbeatable. I used every fucking cheat and safe state in my arsenal, and I could not beat this motherfucker. It all boils down to he's too damn fast, and you're too damn slow. And by the time you get to his final form, he's just a damn aimbot. There's probably somebody out there who can beat him, but it ain't me. It kind of sucks because I kind of liked this game. But if I'm not gamer enough, I'm not gamer enough. Scooby-Doo Unmasked was one of the three multi-platform games that came out on the 6th gen. All three of them start off with a variation of the classic intro. Is that the caveman in a spaceship? I have so many questions to the point I should ask none of them. Okay, this is either the shit from Splatoon, or it's that multicolored soap car washes spray on your car. You know the one that smells really good? Don't drink car wash, by the way. The plot of this game is kind of weird. All the monsters in the game are made out of that goop you just saw in their animatronic. Man, the developers had no idea animatronics would get a stigma to them years later. All the FNAF fans watching right now is like, stigma, stigma dick in that foxy. Ah! The game's a 3D platformer with a hub world and stages. There's only three worlds, but they all have several stages, so that means you're going to be stuck to this same theme for a while. And the first world's theme is Chinatown, and guys, I, I feel like this could be any video game. It's just a good platformer that just happens to have Scooby-Doo in it. Yes, you just heard me say good. This game is actually kind of fun. There's a good variety in the levels, too. Some are extremely linear. Some of them you have to kind of explore to figure out where you're supposed to go. But there are clues hidden in all the stages, and you unlock new levels when you find them. So the game gives you incentive to explore. You got a few different attacks you can do, and you can unlock even more attacks by getting costumes for Scooby, including this Kung Fu one. Well, that tactic almost worked. The best thing about the Kung Fu costume is you can do a Scooby Dookin! Scooby Dookin! Scooby Dookin! All in all, this game is not bad at all. It's not perfect, but it's pretty decent. I do plan to play this some more. So it is possible for Scooby-Doo to have a good game or a decent game, but what about a great game? Like something you would actually play because you wanted to and you would recommend other people play it too. That game is called Scooby-Doo Night of a Hundred Frights. This game had a lot of thought and care put into it by people who genuinely did their homework about the show. This one is all about a ghost named Mastermind, voiced by Tim fucking Curry, who revives all the old monsters from the original show, and Scooby has to defeat him and save the gang. So there's tons of fan service in this game. Even Don Knotts is in it. It's like my pappy always told me. You plant crabgrass, you get crabs. Try jumping on those pesky critters. That should take care of them. This game does a lot of mixing up 2.5D and 3D playing styles, and it does it very seamlessly. Instead of having a hub world and stages, the levels are all connected together and have branching pathways. So it's almost like a freaking Scooby-Doo Metroidvania. And there's a lot of variety in these levels. They never feel samey or boring in any way. There's also a collectathon element in that you need a certain amount of Scooby snacks to unlock certain levels, but it's very forgiving and you don't have to get every single solitary one. You also get items later in the game that unlock new areas and levels. And they even give you ways to fast travel so it isn't a slog trying to get back to those levels. Ah no, I need to be entertaining y'all. I need to be cracking jokes, calling Scooby's mama a bitch because she's a female dog, or asking how does the headless specter still see you if he has no head? But I can't make fun of this game. It's good, like really good, and I'm going to play it some more after I finish this video. It's so good that it aggravates me that it got such low scores. This should be a cult classic that all of you should play. It's on PS2, it's on GameCube, it's on Xbox, and it's cheap. There's no reason for you not to get this game. As a matter of fact, I love this game so much I bought a physical copy. You want another reason to buy this game? Okay, the boss fights have theme songs. Watch out. Hey, 
No, it can't be. It's the caveman. He was frozen in there and now he's out here. I genuinely want to fuck this game. Literally, I want to take my dick and put it in the CD hole and just start ramming it up and down. I hope I have gotten my point across that you need to play this game. So the 6th gen has been pretty kind to Scooby, huh? We got a decent game. We got an excellent game. <sighs> And then we got Mystery Mayhem. Uh, have you ever heard the term gag me with a spoon? Well, gag me with a fucking cactus. This game gives you a bunch of objectives to complete. Go here, pick up that, solve this puzzle, and normally at the end it asks you to defeat all the ghosts on the map. Now on the first level, you don't have a weapon until later. Then you get this book. This book is made to order. No, this book is made to stop that. That book is your weapon and it sucks up ghosts and stores them in the book. Wow, somebody either played Luigi's Mansion or Faces of Evil. Unlike the ghost vacuum in Luigi's Mansion, it has a power meter and when it runs out, you can't use it anymore. And it uses more fuel than an Oldsmobile, so it's not uncommon to run out of power in the middle of sucking up a ghost. Then you either have to find these little things around the level or go back to a recharging area. Recharging your book. What is it, a Kindle? Do they still make those? There's this voice line that Shaggy keeps saying when you suck up ghosts. I thought it only says it when you've got one more ghost left to go, but no, it says this at any point in the game. One last ghost roaming free. One last ghost roaming free. One last ghost roaming free. It's like Shaggy is venting his frustration with his drug addiction. A one last hit is all you'll need and you'll quit, right? Like I can quit when I want to. You can switch between Shag and Scoob at any point, but literally the only difference is Scooby can crawl into small spaces and Shaggy can't. So there's absolutely no reason to pick Shaggy. He's only there so they can have instances where they get split up and have to find each other. Didn't the Grinch have this mechanic too? Oh God, tell me there's no poles in this game. There's a quote unquote stealth mechanic in this game where you have a sneak mode for quietly walking around ghosts, but it doesn't work because ghosts can both see and walk through walls, so there's not really any way to hide. But the game knows this, so it gives you ghost disguises that make the ghost not see you or hurt you. You can even touch them. There was this movie studio level where I kept getting lost and running around the same damn areas over and over trying to find my way. And the whole time, this guy in the background keeps talking to Shaggy. Okay, that looks scared. Like, I am scared. That looks scared. Like, I am scared. Now look nervous. Like, I am nervous. Those audio clips must have played a hundred times while I was running around trying to find where to go. Okay, that looks scared. There's no platforming in this game at all, and you can't jump, so it's just you walking around, looking for clues, solving puzzles, blah, blah, blah. Everything just felt like a grind. Now I know your question, Stu. Does anything else happen in this game? Well, there's a fucking minecart level. Oh my god. This might be the worst minecart level in video game history. Okay, here's the deal. You have to make a perfectly clean pass from one end of the section to the next without getting hit or falling down a hole. The problem is the minecart is going way too fast and they put way too much shit in the way. I want to meet the guy who has these lightning fast reflexes who can finish this minecart level without getting hit. Someone in the comments section will tell me I have a bad memory. Well, you have a bad face. But the worst part is all the alternative routes. There's a bunch of areas where you can switch what track you're on, but only one of them is the right way. The rest are dead ends. Some of these dead ends don't tell you they are one until you've been on it for a while. That's the sadistic fucks who made this game laughing at you. No, literally, they laugh at you. Check out this shit they pulled right here. Watch this. Fuck your mother with a syphilis cock. You see what they did right here? I have to lean to the right so I don't fall in this hole. And they put a switch track right there so you would go into that dead end. This minecart level is insufferable torment and I fucking hate it. Even after I'd finally finished it, yeah, I got past it by the way. I felt absolutely no sense of accomplishment. I just felt like I shouldn't have gone through all that shit. This minecart level can eat my whole ass and throw it back up. Fuck you! Oh, oh, ah, I, I need my medicine. Hold up here. 
Uh, fuck. I got one more to show you, and I'm only going to show you a little bit because PS2 emulation's kind of iffy. You need a pretty hot PC, and my laptop from 2016 with a 1050 doesn't quite cut it. Scooby-Doo First Frights was a tie-in game with Scooby-Doo The Mystery Begins, along with another game called Spooky Swamp. And God, those 3D models are from hell. Speaking of weird styles, have y'all ever seen that Family Guy looking Scooby-Doo show? What was up with that? The main reason I wanted to show you what little I can of it is because this is a Scooby-Doo beat-em-up game. It's Devil May Scoob. And I think that's gonna do it for the Scooby-Doo games. There's several more. In fact, I recorded more, but I can only put so many. So that's our show for today, but I've got a few announcements to make. I've done some updating to the Patreon. To begin with, the only pledge tier I had was $5, and that gets you my Discord, a shout out, and early access. You see the videos before anybody else. However, if you don't need all that extra stuff and just wanna support me or can't afford $5 a month, I am now announcing a $1 tier. That's right one damn dollar one damn dollar and you still get your name at the end of the video how's that sound not only that i've got a patreon goal up so now there's actually incentive to sign up if we can make it to 200 dollars, boys i will make two videos a month instead of one y'all seem to love the idea of more than one video from me a month so let's work together to make that a thing as for me i will see y'all next month with another episode see y'all later Scooby-Doo Looney Tunes Cartoon Universe Adventure. Do I have your fucking attention? This is real. It exists. A Scooby-Doo Looney Tunes crossover game. Not only that, you can get it on Steam. And on some Nintendo console, no one remembers. It had like two screens or some shit. So who do you play in this game? Do you play Scooby? Do you play Bugs Bunny? Let me ask you a question. Have you ever played Sonic Forces? Yeah. You play as your own original Looney Tune Do Not Steal. Why do you only get four species? What if I want to be a marmoset? Hey, there's a yellow cat. My girl Dixie is a yellow cat. Okay, that's closer than what I thought I would get. Fucking great value, Dixie. Okay, here's the deal. This game has four levels, and each level has four stages. So that's 16 stages in all in this whole game. And only four of them are Scooby-Doo. And I'll go ahead and spoil it for you. The Looney Tunes and Scooby-Doo do not interact in any way. Did I mention that this game is $20? There is a story to this game, but it's kind of hard to follow because apparently this game originally had animated cutscenes and they took them out on the 3DS and Steam versions. And only the iPhone version of this game has animated cutscenes, which is no longer on the App Store and is lost to time. So the mobile version of this game is the superior one. Let let that sink in. Be honest, that sound just made you take your headphones off and look around. This is my birthday party, bucko. Actually, Daffy, today is my birthday. We have the same birthday? Oh, this is based on the Looney Tunes show, isn't it? I could tell by how stupid they made Daffy and how bad the humor is. I could go on one hell of a rant about this show, but I ain't gonna. And then it just throws you into the game. No tutorial, no explanation, nothing. Just an arrow. Aren't those game designers wonderful? I think everybody wants their OC in a video game. Too bad it had to be this one. So it looks like we've got an isometric platformer. We've got enemies. We've got coins. We've got enemies. We've got coins. Is that all that's in this game? Actually, you don't even have to collect the coins. All you have to do is get to the goal. She dance, and it kicks you right into the next one. You do get weapons after a while like this anvil that will not hit shit. You don't even need the weapons anyway because your basic attack already kills in one hit. This game for the most part is babby game easy. Even the parts where you're chased by Paul Blart Mall Cop himself. Grab him and bag him. Dixie, you just murdered a person. Oh, there he is. He's fine. And he wants a hug. Damn it, I'm jealous. I want to hug my OC. The most challenge you get is the boss battles, which actually are kind of challenging, but not really. Like once you learn the pattern, you're good. The only ones that are different are the Scooby-Doo theme levels, and the boss battles in them are puzzles that are basically spelled out for you. 
That's about all I've got to say about this game, other than would you believe that WayForward developed this game? Yes, they developed a butchered port of a mobile game. That is one big pile of shit. Speaking of a big pile of shit, welcome to Working Man Games. I'm Stuart K. Riley. This channel is all about suffering. In this case, suffering succotash. I'm funny! Guys, there are so many Looney Tunes games, my god. You search them up on Vim's Lair, think you found them all, and but no, search Bugs Bunny, search Porky Pig, search Sylvester, search Daffy Duck. There's more. Speedy from Gunking Zales has got his own games. In fact, there's more games than I can cover in one video. So I I decided to stop at 16-bit, and I'm leaving out the obvious ones, mostly because Mike Mate won't answer my emails. I just want to beat the shit out of Mike Mate. Is that too much to ask? I guess so, so no birthday blowout or crazy castle. But hey, we got Bugs Bunny on the MS-DOS. Guys, just so you know, this is what PC games used to look like in the 80s. This was back when PC gaming was a downgrade. Let's see how much crypto you mine with a couple of megahertz and no graphics card. So you're stuck in a castle and and there's a bunch of floors, at least a hundred. And from what I can tell, you're supposed to get four keys and then find the exit. What I was never able to figure out is, are the keys in the same place every time or is it randomly generated? And Google turned up shit. I know this is a limitation of 80s DOS games, but I love how the whole castle is pink. I just imagine like it's a Barbie castle. Wouldn't that be a game? Barbie kidnaps Bugs Bunny. It is super easy to get lost. They give you this number that tells you what floor you're on, but it helps like none. They do give you items like ether that slows the enemies down, which is a callback to the episode this is based on. Remember when Bugs got high off ether fumes? More like Drugs Bunny. Ah, this is the second episode I've made drug jokes on. Luckily, there's no Bugs Bunny crack pipes. I, <laughs> I did find this, though. How about Taz? Ah, that's horrifying. How about Taz on the Atari 2600? You see that yellow blotch of pixels? Plixel, pixel, pixel. That yellow blob of pixels is supposed to be Tasmanian Devil. You collect the food, don't touch the dynamite, and that's it. I love the fact that Atari spoon-fed us this shit of this is supposed to be Tasmanian Devil, and we're just supposed to believe that shit. Like, you could get rid of the title screen and just call it Texas Tornado, and it'd just be a twister. Hell, it could be about the movie twister, for all I care. Roadrunner on NES. Now, this was one of those black unlicensed cartridges that Tengen made. This one's based on an arcade game where you collect bird seed while scrolling left and avoiding Wily. I never could make it very far in this game because I kept getting stuck on the boundaries of the level. I know, I know, there's somebody out there that can play this game blindfolded with one hand tied behind their back and speed run it. Well, good for fucking you. You want a damn cookie? Anyway, this game isn't too offensive and it's a decent arcade port. But what about the MS-DOS version? Oh my god, my ears! Ah! Next, we've got two unreleased games for the Commodore 64. Bugs Bunny Private Eye and Daffy Duck the Great Paint Caper. They were apparently finished but never released. I can't get a clear answer on when they were made. I've heard 1984, 1993, 1990. If it came out in the 90s, I could understand why it wasn't released. Nobody was really using Commodores anymore. I'm gonna be honest, I couldn't figure out the Bugs Bunny game. I think it may not be finished, the copy that I have. Could we not make that noise? God, that's annoying. Woo, woo, woo. They put a shitload of enemies in this game. They're fucking everywhere. But luckily, you have a pretty big life bar, so it's not that big of a deal. I found what I think is a door, but I never could figure out how you're supposed to go in it. I feel bad because somebody in the comments will know how to get through that door, and it will probably be something really stupid and simple, and I'll look like a dumbass. Well, wouldn't be the first time. The Daffy Duck game seems to have a lot going on, though. There's a lot of talking to characters, fetching items, and solving puzzles. The controls are kind of weird, but Commodore 64 games only had one button and a joystick, just like an Atari. So that meant that most games had up to jump, and the button was your action button. Don't you love these enemies? A camera with legs and one of those director clapping things. You know what else is weird about the controls? You want to know how you enter a door? Well, up is jump, so it can't be up, right? 
You hold the button down, then press up. I guess when your controls are four directions and a button, you gotta make do with what you got. You notice I'm not really hating on this game all that much. Well, it doesn't bother me, honestly. I could see liking this game if I owned a Commodore. But if this did come out in the 90s, the Super Nintendo was already doing way better stuff than this. Hell, Wolfenstein 3D might have been made during the time this was made. So I guess if there's a bad thing to say about this game, it's giving me nothing to work with. It's not funny. And when Looney Tunes isn't funny, there's something wrong. Cheese Catastrophe. Oh, God. It's Speedy Gonzalez, and he's on the Sega Master System. Well, this game immediately looks wonderful. Oh, you can toss sombreros? Oh, except for when I actually need them to take out this scorpion. So the sombreros aren't infinite. It would have been nice to know that. How hard would it have been to put a sombrero counter? Oh, we uh, quit scrolling. Okay, game. What stupid mundane tasks do we have to do? Well, you got to go down in these holes and then save the kidnapped mice because only the brave can rescue the kidnapped mice. Okay, game, I saved the mouse. Now what? Oh, that is the end of the level. You just can't go there until you save the mice. I see. You know, game, if you were a woman, I'd piss on you and ask you to call me daddy. Bugs Bunny's birthday blowout on the NES will not be reviewed today. Looney Tunes on the Game Boy re-released on Game Boy Color. So I'm Daffy Duck and my weapon is a frisbee. Oh, that's cool. Oh, and immediately I'm fighting Yosemite Sam. Oh, shit, I already see a problem with this Frisbee. Until it comes back to you, you don't have a weapon. Well, that was the fastest boss fight in the world. Oh, yeah, yeah, I definitely changed my mind. This Frisbee is no good. If you keep moving around, it can't get back to you. Just like how I avoid the police. Oh, water levels. You know, my doctor does not prescribe me enough Zoloft to put up with this shit. Ah, I see Looney Tunes' use of blackface didn't end with the show. This guy's actually a bitch to kill. He keeps moving all around and sending out these little fish to give you even less room to move around. Now we're Tweety trying to avoid Sylvester while someone's throwing throwing their garbage at us. Yeah. You know, I could be doing something better with my time than playing this stupid crap. You know how much I want to play Stalker right now? But no, I have to entertain you people. Well, you know what? Entertain yourselves. I'm going to go play Stalker. Oh, a nice creepy dark sewer with a bunch of ambient noise. Wow, I bet nothing out here is going to hurt me in any way, shape, or form. I'm sure there's no monsters or anything like that in here that's totally going to rape my... <laughs> Oh shit, oh shit, oh shit, oh shit! Out of ammo, must use pistol bullets! The pistol does nothing! F fuck it, just run, just run, just fucking run! Ah, <laughs> what have I got? Shotgun, shotgun, there we go. I got him! Yeah! What was I doing? Oh, Looney Tunes, right. When the garbage hits you, then you start going down and can't fly. And more than once, I've fallen straight into a manhole when that happened. Seems like I have the best luck in the world when it comes to people's holes. And I already hate the word holes because it rhymes with poles. And now we're Porky in an airplane doing a shoot 'em up And it's actually kind of fun. Okay, this needs the music. Let me get the music. Now we're Taz and we gotta get all the meat before the time runs out. You know this game's got a lot of variety. I didn't expect a Looney Tunes game to go this hard. This is almost a decent game. But guys, you know this show. And if you don't, something always fucks up what could be a good game. And in this case, it's every single fucking level after this. Now we're Speedy Gonzalez and what is this attack? Do they really expect you to hit an enemy with that? That's about as useless as tits on a boar hog. I've seen people draw tits on a boar. I don't know why, but they decided Speedy needed to be extremely floaty and uncontrollable. He runs like he's on ice, and any little bump knocks him all over the place. And because he's so slippery, it's so easy to overshoot where you're trying to go. And then there's this freaking puzzle where these blocks move around, you gotta try not to be crushed from them, and it seems to take forever! <laughs> this. They put an enemy in this little bitty hole where you can't jump on him. What am I supposed to do? Ariba him to death? Ariba! I guess not. That's all you had to do? Well, off to hang myself. Guys, I'm scared. When I searched that video, this came up. I never thought that YouTube would be the one to reach out to me. I wonder if Frank still works there. Do blondes really have more fun? They sure
sure do. Fuck, they even bought this number. Then there's this Roadrunner stage where I swear it's all a memory theme. You need to memorize the pattern of the rocks and the projectiles Wiley throws at you, or else you're going to get hit more times than a guy who made a dead baby joke at a miscarriage help group. I mean, you can memorize it, yeah, but it takes a hundred tries to get it right, and you only get three lives to do it all in. So get good and get good right fucking now. The last stage has you playing Bugs Bunny. Holy shit! Yeah, apparently you gotta jump every time these spikes come up. I love how the spikes are all this one sprite with no transparency. Uh, the ghost killed me. That's nice. You have enough to worry about with the spikes. They throw ghosts on top of your ass. Oh, fuck off! They put that ceiling there so you'd get hit! I don't know what this room is, but apparently you can turn something on in it. Last part of the game is the big boss rush where you fight all the iconic Looney Tunes characters. Yosemite Sam, Boney the Dinosaur Bones, Bob the Mummy, Not the Singing Frog. I don't know who the fuck this is, but I remember Joey the Rock Throwing Gumball. And finally, Elmer Fudd, the final battle. And he is one tough son of a bitch. Here's something I found out. That that boss health meter is a lie. You would think every time you hit him, you take a hit point away. No, each one equals two hit points. So it's actually this. The best method I could come up with was to try to bounce on his head and stay there. Do not get in front of him or he'll ask fuck you with that spread gun. It took some pure D saves coming, but I actually was able to beat him. And that is Looney Tunes on the Game Boy. Yeah, 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 yeah. I got games to play, man. Let's change it up a little bit. Tasmania on the Super Nintendo. Whoa, was this made by the same people that made Lotus Turbo Challenge? So I kept going forward and forward and forward, thinking I would get to an exit or a finish line or something. Then I found out there is no end. What you're supposed to do is collect these baby chicks. Also, you can apparently eat birds to replenish your health. You can smack into a tree in this game, and apparently, and it took me a while to figure this out, you're supposed to press up and down over and over until you straighten yourself back out. Man, we need more toony shit in video games. Anybody remember cell damage? So you find the baby chicks and eat the defensive baby chicks. And that's the game! I do love that they added the birds leaving his stomach, though. So he didn't eat them, he just vored them. Trust me, I know vore experts. <laughs> oh, hello, Windows default MIDI drum sound. You know when you play Duke Nukem 3D and the drum sounds like this. That's the same one! The only real enemies in the game are these cars on the road, and you have to dodge them, which can be hard to do when you're spinning. For some reason, you could still get hurt if you hit the back of a car that's going away from you. Anyway, that's the meat and taters of this game. It just makes you want to play Lotus or OutRun. Speedy Gonzalez on the Game Boy. Now, I had this as a kid, and I remember it very well. Now, let me ask y'all something. What kind of music do you think of when you think of Speedy Gonzalez? Do you think of something like this? Probably so, but I bet you don't think of Mozart. What a freaking odd choice of music for a Speedy Gonzalez game. Okay, boys, I want y'all to really analyze what's going on in this map. You got some hills that make you faster, you got these bridges, you got these waterfalls, and you've got this, and you also have this. Gee, I fucking wonder where they got their inspiration. This is the biggest ripoff of Jazz Jackrabbit I've ever seen. One thing you'll notice quickly is there aren't that many enemies in the game. Mostly what you'll be worried about is spikes and pitfalls. What enemies are here kill you in one hit, but they're not that much of a threat unless you touch them. Now, because this game is Sonic expired... Expired? Yes, yeah, it's a dead Sonic game. Because this is Sonic inspired, you'll be tempted to go fast in certain areas, which you may have to do to get past certain spots, but you better keep an eye where you're going because this game expired expects you to jump over shit while still going really fast. Overall, it's a pretty easy game. I remember it being hard as a kid. Maybe I just sucked. And you get unlimited continue, so the game gives you every opportunity to beat it. I thought I was really gonna tear into this game, but you know what? It's fine. There's also Aztec Adventure Speedy Gonzales, which is a little bit better. There's a lot more running in this one than there is in the other one. There's also these parts where you've got a boat and the scrolling on this looks really nice. You also get weapons like the very traditional Mexican weapon, the boomerang. Wait, what? Why would Speedy have a boomerang? That's not Mexican. But then again, what 
is a traditional Mexican weapon. If you say knife, I'm gonna hurt you. Okay, I just googled Speedy Gonzalez with a knife. I hate the internet. Here's a weird thing that happened. I'm fighting Sylvester, and his heart points again equal two hits each. But for some reason, after only taking two hearts away, he ran off. I was inching forward very slow expecting something to happen, but no, I won apparently. That was odd. Anyway, not a groundbreaking game, but not a bad game either. It gets a pass. Sylvester and Tweety and KG Capers on the Genesis. This is an interesting one. You're supposed to follow Tweety around the level until you reach the end. You're given binoculars to see where Tweety is, and Sylvester keeps saying this. Hello, breakfast. Hello, breakfast. Yes, I am 10 years old. Going up the stairs is funny too. Apparently the music changes when you go up them. You can hit Tweety by scratching him, but I don't know if that actually does anything other than give you points. Remember when people gave a shit about points? Me neither. I couldn't get past the second level though because I couldn't stop falling off of shit. So these power lines, apparently depending on where you're standing, you can fall off of them if you stand there for too long. But there's other places on the lines where you don't fall off at all. Game can't make up its mind what the rules are. I must have played this shit for half an hour trying to figure out how I'm supposed to get to Tweety. And this game finally pissed me off to the point I couldn't take no more. One out of ten and you only get that point because of Hello Breakfast. <laughs> okay, I'm a bit be honest i've been nice so far not giving these games a hard time but this game this game could go suck a gun barrel till it comes daffy duck the marvin missions on game boy now this would be another simple ho-hum mediocre platformer except for one thing they give you a jet pack with limited energy and that's how you jump Look at this shit. Now, I know it doesn't look all that horrible right now, but trust me. You immediately get into a mini boss fight with K9, and he runs around at Mach 11 speed aimlessly while you get fucked. But I'll show you who gets fucked. Watch this. <laughs> Oh, fuck this. Are you kidding me? Hey, what is that? Is that an item? Oh, fuck off. I thought you could touch it. Now, here's the first problem with the jetpack. It doesn't go far enough. So you need to be, like, right on the edge of the platform. Oh, no. It put me at the start of the level. I guess we're doing this shit again. Okay, I'm gonna try again and get right on the... Oh, oh, good grief. Wait, what if... Oh! That's stupid. So you're telling me you have to fall down, then do the jetpack. That's nice. Oh, you motherfucker. How you expect me to get through there? Well, it took a few hundred tries, but I got it. Rocket Knight Adventures, this is not. But the next jump is even worse. <laughs> I did it! I did it! No! To whoever it was that came up with this jetpack shit, I hope their mother gets raped by an octopus. Oh, hey, I did it. Bugs Bunny Rabbit Rampage on the Super Nintendo. How many games have I done so far? Jeez. So it looks like you can kick, you can throw pies, and apparently enemies can block your attack. Come on. Come on, dude. Oh, there. Oh, good grief. Three dogs? You think that's enough enemies? Oh, come on, dude. Die. Here's Elmer Fudd, and apparently his gun has homing bullets, and they're kind of hard to see. The hit detection on Elmer's really screwed up. Sometimes you'll hit him, sometimes you won't. He can take a fuck ton of hits, too. I hit him so many times, I started wondering if that's what you were supposed to do. And then finally this happened. I win? The second level is where the game rips you a new wabbit hole. There are so many projectiles and pitfalls and crap everywhere. There's nowhere to rest and figure where you're supposed to go. You just go. And you keep having to make these leaps of faith that may end you up in a hole. Oh, for God's sakes, is that shit where the projectiles go as fast as you? Ugh. 
When I finally get to the boss of the level, I can't figure out how to hit him. I see a target on the floor, but I have no idea what you're supposed to do with it. And a bunch of homing bullets kick my ass. Look at this. Look at this, man. So much crap everywhere. Let's think back to the 90s for a minute. Can you imagine getting this game for Christmas? It's like, here you go. Here's your new game, honey. And you're like, yay, Bugs Bunny. Woohoo. And you play the game and it's like, oh, this, this isn't good. This, this is horrible. And your mom's all like, do you like your new game, honey? And you just had to go, uh, uh, yeah. It happened to me. Speedy Gonzalez and Los Gatos Benditos on the Super Nintendo. Bruh! They're not even hiding that this is Green Hill Zone. I mean, look at it. What else could it be? Emerald Hill Zone? What? <laughs> now you're trolling me. No, no, no. This game ain't real. This ain't real. Wait, it is? Oh, no. Well, okay, it's Sonic with one little exception. You have to save all your friends. They're in these little cages. But from what I've heard, there's no secret ending or anything like that for getting all the mice. It's literally just for score. Now, even though this is a Sonic ripoff, would you believe me, guys, if I told you that it kind of works? It doesn't make me want to puke? And from what I've researched about this game, that's kind of the general consensus. This game was slow and given one-star reviews in the magazines, but everybody who actually owned the game actually liked it. For every bad review I find of this game, I find five good ones. So maybe you might want to give this one a try? I didn't hate it. It's not the best game in the world, but I didn't hate it. I did think the game over screen was pretty fucked up, especially when you say no. Damn, dude. That's fucking dark. At least it's not that Felix the Cat game over. Oh, shit. Total whiplash. Hello. And we're going back to Game Boy with Tasmania on the uh, Mattel Aquarius. Of course the fucking Game Boy. Oh, my God. That face is the definition of colon three. Oh, God. Oh, that is so cute. You know what they did? They made part of the screen flash so it would represent water. That is adorable. Okay, first problem. When Taz starts spinning, you can't stop stop him. You have to wait on him to stop on his own. That's kind of shit. You know, it's not really blowing me away, but I can't find anything wrong with it either. It feels like a decent platformer. It just feels dated, you know, like what you would expect a Game Boy game to be. And then this level happened, where you get thrown in the water with no explanation to what you're supposed to do. Turns out you're supposed to press the spin button repeatedly to stay on top of the water. Look, everybody, he's walking on water. Jesus Cristo! It's pretty solid it overall. I've got nothing against it. Let's move on to some grade A trash called Taz Munching Madness. Let me tell you something. If Ron White reviewed video games, he'd say, games that make you go Because as soon as the gameplay started, I knew I was gonna hate this game and made a loud, annoyed grunt. Ugh. I mean, look at it. You can almost smell how cheap it is. So what are you supposed to do in this game? Guys, I have no fucking clue. And that music gets annoying really quick, too. As you can see, there's arrows in the map, but when I go where it's telling me to go, I don't find anything, or I find a dead end. I don't know if this game knows what you're supposed to do. The closest thing I got to progress is I found a character that wanted me to race him, and I tried to race him. Look at this. I tried to race him and then died during the race, and I never could figure out how to get back over there, even with the fucking arrows. Negative 30 out of 10. This sucked ass. I had the same problem with another Taz game called Escape from Mars. I was actually stuck at my starting point for a little while trying to figure out where to go. Then by sheer accident, accident, I figured out what you're supposed to do. You can apparently wall jump with the spin attack. Which I'm not gonna lie is pretty cool. Until I got stuck in this one place that seemed to only have one way in and out. And I could not for the life of me get the wall jump to work. So I was just stuck. Again, somebody in the comments will tell me, Stu, you dumb fuck, you're supposed to do this, this, and this. Listen, if I'm having to ask people how to play or get a fucking walkthrough off YouTube for the first fucking level, that's a bad game. So eat my whole ass. And there's a lot of it. I'm, f I'm fat. 
Oh. Roadrunner and Coyote's Desert Demolition on the Genesis. Okay, this is so cute. Instead of having music in the game, there's musical cues for everything that you do. You get all these crazy Acme gadgets to try to help you get through the stage like these springs. Play the music. Oh, and for no reason, here's a dog cock rock. Really makes you think. Uh, this was another one of those games where I couldn't figure out where the hell I'm supposed to go. This is the second level, and I can't figure out where to go. Why did games have to be so damn cryptic back then? And you know I say that, but Super Mario World and Yoshi's Island didn't have you wandering around clueless as a motherfucker. You know what it could be? Just bad game developers. I looked up the people that developed this Blue Sky Software. They were a subsidiary of Titus. You know what Titus made? Superman 64. That horrible Taz game was M4 Limited, the people that made that Resident Evil Game Boy game. You know what they did before that? They made Windows 95 screensavers! Now then, this company called Sunsoft had the exclusive publishing rights to all the Looney Tunes games on Game Boy and Super Nintendo, and Sunsoft would always hire the lowest freaking bidders to make their games, though sometimes they would make them in-house, and then Acclaim would publish it. As was the case for Porky Pig's Haunted Holiday, but did Sunsoft working on it make it any better? Actually, guys, this game's kind of impressive. Basically, the premise is Porky Pig is stuck inside a nightmare, and they sure go out of their way to make sure it's a scary nightmare. The music is actually really fucking creepy, man. like, damn, calm down, it's just a Porky Pig game. I really admire the graphics in this part of the level. It reminds me of Mickey Mania. Hey, watch this, I'm gonna cheese it. Yeah, speedrun, boys. The second level's got some weird music, too. You hear that weird lo-fi whistling noise? Makes it sound like unsettling. But how is the game, you ask? Stop talking about the music. How's the game? Well, it's a platformer with pretty decent controls. The game gives out hit points and one-ups like they're candy, so it's not too awful hard. Even a piss-poor gamer like myself can play it. Sometimes you get a boss battle that has a puzzle to solve, like to kill the Yosemite Sam, you have to make his bullets hit this frying pan and knock back to him. And why is Yosemite Sam 10 feet tall? Don't question it. I talk to macro fetishes so much it doesn't even bother me anymore. Well, this game has to get ruined somehow, huh? Or I wouldn't be talking about it still. Well, you know what? It's got water levels, and they suck. They suck harder than a pent-up shop vac. Okay, so you have to get on these bubbles and use them as platforms. And it doesn't look like a problem now, but boy, does it turn into a problem later. Also, you would think you'd be able to get on this little stick right here, but no, it's just for decoration. Come on, music, I was praising you. It's like the sound my guitar makes when I leave the amplifier on. They managed to make this level the most cryptic fucking maze, I swear. It's perfectly possible to circle around and go right back to your starting point accidentally. Running around in circles trying to figure out where to go. And the whole time, this fucking noise is looping over and over. Did you know that scientists found out that certain sound frequencies can trigger a man's urge to kill? It's like the brown note, but people die. That's your review. If you play Porky Pig, you'll go on a murder spree. If this bubble section doesn't cause you to burn your whole damn house down. Okay, let me explain this bullshit. You have two things here that make bubbles you use as platforms. What you're supposed to do is set them off as close to the same time as possible. If you don't get the bubbles close together, you can't jump back and forth from them easily. And these ceilings are spaced to where you have to do this just right. If you're too slow, you fucked up. Okay, there we go. Now here's the bu- oh, damn it! Now, okay, now give me what- no, give me the bubble. Give me the bubble. No. Give me the other bubble. Then the other one. What? Why? These things decide to give you the bubble when they want to. Okay, man. We got the bubbles. Now, don't fuck this up. Do not fuck this up. 
Okay. Damn it! All right, give me the bubbles. We'll do this again. We'll get... What? Oh! You have to be in that, like, precise spot before you can get on the bubble. What the fuck, man? Oh, finally did it. And there's a checkpoint. Thank God. Oh, no. I guess it was such a good fucking puzzle, we have to do it again. No! You piece of shit! Who was the bastard who thought this was a good idea for a puzzle? I hope somebody ties them to the back of a semi-truck and then runs them down the interstate. In fact, I hope it's a chicken truck so they smell chicken shit the whole time they're being drug across the road. And I hope their cat gets gonorrhea. And then their wife catches it from the cat. And then he gets it from the dog. <sighs> Okay, I've got it out of my system now. You know, I got a good mind to end the video right here, but I don't want to leave on a sour note like that. How about Daffy Duck in Hollywood on the Sega Genesis? Well, I can make that review pretty damn short because I never got past the first damn level. From what I can gather, you're supposed to collect these time bombs, but guys, I do not have the slightest clue where they are. And it makes me feel like a jackass too because it could be just in plain fucking sight. The game doesn't seem to be all that bad, honestly. So I'm in this weird place where I don't know if I should give it a bad review or not, because what if the game's not bad? What if I'm bad? You know what I mean? So I'm gonna have to give this question mark out of five. Daffy Duck the Marvin Missions on Super Nintendo. Hopefully this will be a lot better than the Game Boy one called this. Oh, you got a shop where you can buy weapons. What are you buying? I don't know what any of this fucking shit does, but I'm gonna buy it. That's how I buy crypto. Okay, first problem. The gun has knockback. That is annoying. Oh, oh, that, oh, oh, that is floaty. Floaty. See there, I'm scared to shoot my gun for all the damn knockback. Now we're fighting some of the Martians. Let's try out the electric gun. Dude, electric gun sucks, man. Who the fuck is this? The Monopoly guy? That noise is hysterical. The spread gun seems pretty badass. I gotta admire just how many weapons you have to choose from. And apparently you can even buy one-ups. The levels in this one do feel like they're mazes, but it doesn't feel cryptic. It's more like it was made to be that way. As if the game wants you to explore. They do give you a map, which is nice, but I need a damn magnifying glass to look at it. I was pretty close to saying that I like this game, but then I came to this Marvin Martian boss fight that is fucking impossible. It wouldn't be so bad if he didn't have this fucking saw he was waving everywhere. Guys, I tried my damnedest, but I could not beat this sumbitch. So here again, another game that I can't get past the first level. It's just like marriage. It looks like it's gonna be good and then drills you a new asshole. That is my review. This game is like marriage. Looney Tunes back in action. Okay, look at this crusty image quality and listen to this horrible music and you tell me what console this is on. The Game Boy fucking Advance, right? Yep. And if you know your Game Boy Advance games that are licensed movie tie-ins, how much you want to bet? You know what? I'm not even going to joke. It's isometric. What was this fucking obsession with isometric games on the Game Boy Advance? Ew, this game makes me physically ill to look at. You want to know what this game is like? Well, I will tell you. Have you ever changed a litter box that is used by multiple cats? That feeling of having to take this little plastic shovel and dig up all this disgusting feline waste out of this poo-poo sand. You bag it all up, and then you have to haul this bag of horrible-smelling, sinus-burning feces and urine to the trash outside. And when you finally... Get to that sink and get your hands all full of soap and cleaned off. You let out a sigh of relief that it is finally over and you won't have to do this again for a while. That is what playing this game is like. What do you do in the game? I don't fucking know. Foghorn said something about making money and grabbing monkeys or some shit like that. I don't know, man. I don't know. I was just so ready to quit playing this. Full litter box out of 10. <sighs> I've got one more game. That's right, we're almost done. And it's a good one. I remember seeing this game in Walmart, and I told my parents, Mom, Dad, if you buy this game for me, it will be the last game I ever buy. That's how I convinced them to buy it for me. Needless to say, it wasn't the last game I ever bought. But I gotta say, if it would have been, it would have been a good one to stop at. Looney Tunes Operation Carrots, also known as Carrot Crazy. It's such an unassuming game. You would never guess in a million years that a Game Boy Color Looney Tunes game would be decent. And
and that only two people worked on it. In fact, I have names, and I had to look up how to pronounce them. Let's see how I did. Fernando Valles and Guillaume Dubel. They specialized in handheld games, and this is the best one they ever made. The object of the game is you have to find four parts of a clapboard on a level. Yeah, I looked up what that thing is called. Luckily, they're pretty much hidden in plain sight, so you could just go front to back on a level. So there's a very small chance you'll have to backtrack. You can play as Lola in this game, and she's got an umbrella that lets you glide down slowly. Look, you get to play as Lola. That ought to be worth the cost of admission, right? Bugs, however, can tunnel under certain areas, and both of them can eat super carrots that allow them to fly. You see that carrot meter in the bottom right? Well, Bugs and Lola can float in the air for a little while after you jump, and when you fill that carrot meter up, you can do it longer. For the most part, you'll find the game pretty easy, honestly. It doesn't really get challenging until you get to the space level, which, by the way, has some banging music. You know what, I used to let this game idle just so I could listen to the music. If I had one complaint, the boss battles are all the same thing. It's just the game auto-scrolling and you dodging obstacles, and then hitting the boss with a hammer and dodging their projectiles. But if you know what, if that's the only problem I have with a Looney Tunes game, I think this might be the best one we've looked at so far. And that is where we're going to end the video. Guys, I believe this is my longest one yet, and I sure do certainly hope that y'all like it. And you know, let me know, man. I'm small time. Every Every little comment, every like means something to me. I'm not a huge YouTuber. I don't plan to be, I don't try to be, and I don't sell myself as one. That's the whole reason it's called Working Man Games, because I'm just one of y'all. I just happen to have a good microphone and a bad accent. But that's our show for the day, but I'll go ahead and spoil it and tell y'all what the next one is. You know, I've been adding home computer games into the mix, and for me, that's uncharted territory, because I didn't grow up with those 80s computers like Commodore 64s and Amigas. So now Next episode, we're going to dive our heads way deep into the bread box shaped bowels of the Commodore 64. I'm sure for many of you, you're going to see a lot of games you ain't never seen before. And same here. Going to be just like going to a foreign country. And boys, I got great news. We are so close to our $200 Patreon goal. And like I said, if we do hit it, I'll start doing two videos a month. You can join up for $5 or one damn dollar and you'll still get your name on the board. Which reminds me, I need to show you that board and I need to get out of here. See y'all later. I guess this is my running joke now. Cartoons with weed stuff. I will never get over the Scooby-Doo crack pipe phenomenon. Tom and Jerry toe injury. In 1940, MGM released a cartoon short called Puss Gets the Boot featuring Jasper the Cat and Jinx the Mouse. The short was made by William Hanna and Joseph Barbera who would go to make such timeless classic characters such as The Infamous Paper Doll Man. Then some other stuff happened and it became Tom and Jerry and it got passed around like a Scooby Dooby to several different directors, including our Lord and Savior Chuck fucking Jones. I bow to you, O oh Chuck Man. You're the whole reason Dixie looks like a Warner Brothers character that was banned for being too sexy. So yeah, it's time to look at video games pertaining to Tom and Jerry. Something I noticed is most of the Tom and Jerry games were all published by the same people, except for a few oddballs. High Tech Expressions and New Kid Co. You know what High Tech is famous for? Mega Man. On DOS! <laughs> Both High Tech and New Kid Co. were publishers of kid-oriented games. You know, the games that eBay sellers throw into a lot with an actual good game, so you'll have to buy those shitty games to get the good one. I'm on to you, eBay sellers! So that gives you an idea of what we're in for. Alright, so let's start with a game from the computer that makes me want to commit Suzuki every time I play it. Ugh, the Commodore 64. You know how long it took to load this time? Three minutes. Which is still not as bad as the 20 minutes of a tape. So you have a bunch of rooms with cheese in them and you have to get them all before time runs out and every time Tom grabs you, you lose time. Guys, what did I say in the C64 review? I said the British do not know how to program a jump. 
Well, here's more proof of that. You slow down when you jump and have little to no control of it midair. To jump on a platform, you have to jump on it pixel perfect in order to land on the platform or else you just fall flat on your ass. For some reason, you can't go through the legs on the shelves except for the bottom ones? That physically makes no sense. What, are the bottom legs further back than the other ones? That'd be some goofy-ass Ikea shit. There's also this fake 3D section where you try to grab all the cheese in the hallways. Does the cheese in these hallways even count? I really do not know or care. I tried out the Atari ST and the Amiga version of this same game to see if they were better, but literally the only difference is on the Amiga version, Tom makes this noise when he grabs you. Oh, apparently I can go through this leg. Make up your mind, game. They just made this game up as they went. Kind of how I write this script. Catastrophe apparently cannot open commander. Not more DOS crap. Da 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 da. I had to learn this song in school. Fuck you. How many minutes do you want one game to last? Uh, do you mean in general? Because hot take here, I think games last a little too long nowadays. So let's see what we've got here. Wait, why does Jerry turn into a blow up doll? That don't look right. Neither does that. Tom wants a mouthful of brown tic tacs. So what I gather is you're supposed to beat up Tom as much as possible before time runs out. But oh man these controls. The layout isn't weird or anything, it's just it's very unresponsive. You have to tap the direction you want to go like a hundred times before it will actually register. And you can't get any of these weapons or traps to act right. But Tom can sure fuck you up. Am I gonna have to start putting a loud noise warning on my videos? I can kinda get these eggs to work, but only if I tap the button over and over. Then Tom gets a mallet and starts stun locking me over and over. I I'm stuck, I can't move. Great fucking game, great motherfucking game. That's it, press the space bar to play again. No! Tom and Jerry and Tuffy on the NES. What is this title text? It looks like a ransom note. So we got a platformer and Jerry has a throwing weapon and boy do I love me some throwing weapons. Mm, especially when they arc right over what I'm trying to kill. That's the good shit, yes sir. Okay, kill the spider. Kill the fuck. kill the fucking sp- Oh my god, come on! There, fuck. The game's levels are set up like mazes. There's no clear indication that you're going the right direction or even making any progress. There's no checkpoints, markers, nothing. This wouldn't be such a big deal if most of the level didn't look the same. The one thing I can give it though is even though there's no checkpoints, when you die, you start at the same spot you died at and you get continues that start you at the end of whatever level you were on, so at least it's forgiving. There's other weapons in the game, but as much as I make fun of the throwing weapon, it does get the job done. If the levels weren't so convoluted and hard to navigate, I might actually like this game. But you know what they say, the wind she blew, the shit she flew, and on road Paul Revere. Let's try out Tom and Jerry on the Super Nintendo. You still have the same throwing weapon, but this time you can aim it up or aim it down. The levels in this game are a lot more more straightforward and linear than the last game. The first half of the game is kinda easy, honestly. The only thing that takes some getting used to is some jumps require you to do a double jump. You know how in Mario 64, if you jump twice, you jump higher. But you gotta do that second jump exactly when you hit the ground or it won't work. There's only a few areas where you have to do this, so it's not much of a big deal. I had this game as a kid and I've kinda learned its little quirks. Like I know right here, the exit is just under me. Speed run, boys. One thing you'll learn about me is sometimes I'm full of shit. The boss battles against Tom are pretty decent, actually. Also, I just noticed that Tom's head is gigantic compared to the size of the machine. What has he got, an itty bitty little body or something and a ginormous head? The final boss fight is you having to fight Tom three separate times, and each time you get a piece of a rocket. Once you got it all, you give it to Tom and... And that's Tom and Jerry for the Super Nintendo. It's not bad. In fact, I would say go out and play it. Let's see what Sega has for us. Tom and Jerry the movie on Sega Master System. Green screen. So the game automatically scrolls forward with Jerry. And what the hell is this Prince of Persia jump shit? Game devs, your jump does not require 50 frames of animation. It's sluggish, uncontrollable, and not fun. You know what else isn't fun? 
having to stand still for two seconds after you jump. What is even the purpose? God forbid we want to move our character after we're done jumping. This game was made in 1992. Mario and Sonic both were around at this point. I know I complain a lot about bad jumping, but it's the worst sin you could do in your platformer. Right next to fall damage. Do I have to sit here and explain the mechanics of a good jump? I'll tell you what, one day I will make a whole video where I explain how a jump in a video game works. We have to make sure atrocities like this never happen again. Anyway, the game. You follow Jerry and try to avoid all the hazards. Which is easier said than done because you have such a shitty j- uh, Okay, I'll shut up about the jump, I swear. There's two other things about this game that bother me. One, why does Jerry have landmines? And two, in one level, you get hit by a droplet of water and lose health. But in another level, you can swim underwater. I guess the water has lead poisoning or something. Oh, look, guys, it's nondescript blue porcupine. Must advance swiftly. Okay, how is Jerry doing that? Oh, never mind. It's my fault. I got the video the wrong way. There we go. Now it's right. Tom and Jerry frantic antics on the Genesis. This one was developed by Beam Software. You know what else they made? The Back to the Future NES games and <laughs> the Way of the Exploding Fist. <laughs> and you know what? It fucking shows in this game. I couldn't even get past the first damn level. They give you a pretty good size health bar, but you need it because there's a metric fuck ton of enemies and they can all suck the life out of you faster than a buzzkill friend who won't shut up about their mommy issues. Jake, Houston, 275 Grove Street, Social Security number 285. The main problem I have with it is Tom goes too far to the right of the screen, so you can't see what's coming at you. So I have to do that thing where you move a little bit, stop, move a little bit, stop, and that's not fun. Stop not being fun. You see, like right there. By the time you see something, it's already hit you. Unless you have these lightning fast smash player reflexes. And if you happen to be a smash player, get the fuck off my video, you piece of dog shit. If it ain't the fire hydrants, it's these redneck rats or granny's teeth trying to kill you. You just can't get a break. So you know what? This game can make like Chris Chan and go fuck its mama. Motherfucker. Tom and Jerry frantic antics. You notice that most of these are tie-ins with the movie? Well, I guess now I have to say the old movie. There's a new one now. I haven't seen it, but I remember this one very well. And I'm not going to be the guy that says, oh, the old one was better. No, this one sucked donkey dick. And for what I've been told, this one does too. Guys, comment section. Did Tom and Jerry ever have a good movie, direct-to-video, or anything like that? Back to the game. What's this, a Razor scooter? I had one of them things. The handle broke off in my hands, and it became a really shitty skateboard. Uh, okay? Okay. Now I'm in a house that's being torn down and this damn wrecking ball keeps coming out of nowhere kicking my ass. You miss me, bitch. Oh, eat my whole ass. Well, just rub it in my face that I died. That's a big fat nope from me, Ghost Rider. Next, Tom and Jerry Mouse Hunt on the Game Boy Color. In this one, you're fighting Jerry to get the biggest amount of mice into a basket. Whoever gets the winning score wins. Pretty arcadey stuff, but you know what? It works. The controls are solid and precise. It's a simple, easy to get into game. I've got nothing against this game. I ended up playing it for an extended period because I was legit having fun. This gets a pass. Good game. I actually played it enough to get into the bonus game. You want to know what the bonus game is? A fucking Game & Watch game. How cool is that? I spent way too many hours on Game & Watch Gallery, so I eat shit like this up. I already liked this game, now I love it. Let's move on. Tom & Jerry Mouse Attacks on Game Boy Color. I hope this one's going to be good too. <laughs> That's good. I didn't expect a Tom and Jerry rave party. So it's a platformer. Like the NES game, it's not particularly linear, but it's way easier to get an idea of where you're supposed to go. There's also items you can get to go to new areas by collecting enough MacGuffins. When you do, you find a secret door to go to a mini game, and when you win, you get the item. They hit a home run with this game. The jump is absolutely perfect. The controls feel nice. This spider boss was kind of hard, though. He'll run around all over the place trying to hit you and throwing shit at you, kind of like your stepfather 
when he's drunk. BBF? No, FBBF. No, FFBBF. Okay. Oh, B. Okay, so big fucking fat big booty fucker. Second boss is Tom with a water hose. He's a pushover. Just hit him in the head with the bowling ball. Are you a big booty fucker? No, 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 you. <laughs> Man, they killing me with this awesome music. Well, I guess that's all I got to say about this game. Tom and Jerry Mouse Attacks. It's good. I'm actually kind of hopeful now. Are the rest of these games going to be good? <laughs> we still haven't done the Game Boy Advance games yet. Game Boy Advance has let me down so many times in the past. Is it going to do it this time? Tom and Jerry and the Magic Ring on GBA. I've heard of that movie, but never seen it. Is it any good? <laughs> Game, you can't give me stuff like this because I'll exploit it. Wait a minute, wait a minute. Well, hold up, hold up. Is this what I think it is? It is. Holy shit. Let me change the music. <laughs> Some game developers sat down in a room and somebody said, the world needs a Tom and Jerry beat-em-up game. And here it is. Like, I can't even review this because I'm just so shocked by what I'm seeing. I guess if I had to say something, there's a big lack of moves. You either punch awkwardly or use a weapon. These red cats take a lot of fucking hits too. You'll drain half your health just trying to kill a couple of them. The funniest thing is when you die, you get sent to hell. The big deal breaker for me though is that the game feels samey pretty quick. You're killing the same enemies, the same amount of enemies, and the same ho-hum boring backdrops. So for that, I gotta give it a no-go. Speaking of hell, here's Tom and Jerry Infernal Escape. Escape? Like from hell? Are we gonna get the Tom Slayer? Oh dude, the menu is just straight up you're in hell. I wish you a very warm welcome, my dear furry friend. Wow, I guess furries do yiff in hell. This angel cat tells Tom that he can go back to Earth if he completes a bunch of tests. What is up with Tom's face? He looks like an Easter Island statue had sex with a gremlin. So you have to find a whole bunch of golden bones to finish the level. And guys, I could not finish the first damn level. The level is so confusing, I have no idea where I'm supposed to go. I've deducted that I have to find stuff to open new areas in the level, but where I don't know. After I found all the golden bones I could possibly find, I just kept running around I'm clueless. One interesting thing though is when I lost all my lives, I went back to hell and there's a hell level. And then this level, you grab back all your lost lives and then go back to the level, which I will admit was a neat concept. But even a blind squirrel nuts every now and then. I think that's how that goes. Tom and Jerry Tales on GBA. This one was just plain odd. You start off with a top down view. Oh, thank God it's not isometric. And I thought this was the whole game and it took me a while to figure out the game wants you to walk towards Tom. Then you start a mini game where you're sawing down table legs to get the table to hit Tom in the head. And then you take a knife and stab him to death. Uh, no, you don't. Okay, when I said you have your head up your ass, I meant your ass. Then you start this platforming sequence where there's hardly any enemies at all, and you just get all the cheese and go to the end of the level. I'm starting to get the feeling this might be a babby game. Most of the games are like overly easy, and the platform stages are almost insulting how easy they are. So this might have meant to be a little, little kid's game. <laughs> Was that Mel Blank? Wow, Mel Blank doing Tom's voice long after he died. And I guess Jerry too. Toast. Finally, it started repeating the same mini games, and that's where I was like, okay, I get it, and shut the game off. Now we get to the 3D games with Tom and Jerry House Trap on the good old piss station. Basically, you and Tom get weapons and start beating the shit out of each other until somebody's life runs out. And to spice it up a little, there's traps all around the house. <laughs> That was not a bad Tom yell. The problem with this game is it's pretty much a one-trick pony. The only thing that changes the further you get into the game is more rooms open up in the house. Other than that, you just continue to beat up Tom. This is one of those games that's good in short bursts, I guess. Like when you want ice cream, you only buy a little of it. You don't buy a whole tub to eat right then. Especially if it turns out the ice cream isn't all that great. I would buy ice cream, but my damn refrigerator shat out on me. It's doing this thing 
thing where it works when it wants to. So now I don't trust it to take care of ice cream anymore. Maybe I should make that a Patreon goal. Get a new refrigerator. You see, I've done gone on a tangent about refrigerators. I'm not even talking about the game anymore. That's how uninteresting this game is. Let's move on. Tom and Jerry Fists of Furry on the Nintendo 64. This game was not bad, actually. It's a 3D fighting game. You've got throwable items. You've got melee weapons. You've got a punch. You've got power-ups. It's pretty good. You unlock other characters the more you play, and there's slight differences between them, but it's basically pretty balanced. The only weird thing I found is sometimes the AI likes to spam the double jump for some reason. Get down here, you fucker. There we go. Back in the day, it actually got some fairly decent reviews. People compared it to Power Stone and Smash, and even though they said it didn't hold a candle to those games, it was still good. The main thing that everybody said about it that they didn't like is it was two-player only when the N64 could do four players. And that would be great, four players all together fucking each other. Up, fucking each other up, I mean. But as it turns out, reviewers would get their wish because later, New Kid Co. would release a re- remake of this game. Tom and Jerry War of the Whiskers on PS2, Xbox, and GameCube. It takes everything the N64 did and just improves on it. Now you can have four players all at once. I played most of this on easy mode, and when they say easy mode, they're not kidding. It's almost babby mode. On this version of the game, they added a bunch of environmental stuff that can hit you, as well as a berserk mode that gives you, like, double damage or something. Oh, that's not gonna get annoying. Wait a minute, I have an idea. <laughs> it's beautiful. All in all, the game's not bad, though I'm not gonna sit here and say it's the greatest fighting game ever made or some shit. For one thing, the characters all seem to be about the same. I thought maybe there was kind of a difference between them, but I'm thinking not. And there's only a handful of stages. They made it painfully obvious this is a budget game. But you know what? It's probably $2 on Amazon and free to emulate, so give it a try. If you don't like it, no harm, no foul. And that's the end of Tom and Jerry video games. But that's not all of them, is it? There's another one. And you've been probably waiting this whole video for me to talk about it. Thanks to the wonderful people in the little country of China, we have a Tom and Jerry gotcha game. There is a game called Tom and Jerry Chase that's only available in Asia. And guys, I tried to emulate it. I surely did. I tried my damnedest to get this game to work, but I can't do it. So we're just gonna have to look. From what I've been able to tell, you have three mice and one cat, and the cat has to catch all the mice. And in typical gotcha game fashion, there's levels, there's ranks, there's costumes, there's separate versions of characters. It's what you would expect it to be. What I didn't realize, though, is how serious China is about this game. This wasn't just another throwaway gotcha game for China. This game was serious. In fact, it's considered an eSport in China. There's gamer clans for this thing. I didn't realize until a friend told me that Asia is very fucking obsessed with Tom and Jerry, and they spared no expense making this game. Like, you You've probably already seen some of the promotional artwork for this thing. If you have it, here we go. You've probably already seen this one. China, please don't sexualize the baby. How about this one that looks like a fucking Solitarobo character? You know who that's supposed to be? This guy, who was in the show for all of one minute. And can we talk about the art style? This is amazing. But I never would have guessed this was official artwork for a Tom and Jerry game. Do you even know his name? I didn't. His name is Cooper. I'm under the impression that he didn't have a name to begin with and they gave him a name. So he's Cooper now, and apparently he's super OP according to people who play the game. Look at this. This looks like Ratchet and Clank fan art. You know what else I found out about this picture? That's not Jerry. That's his cousin from that one episode. There's a lot of those guys from one episode characters on here. Like, who the fuck is this? Who is that? This just straight up looks like someone's OC. Look at this Detective Jerry Jojo looking motherfucker. And there's so much more of this artwork and it all looks so good. But that's how they get you. They get you with all this cool looking artwork. It's like, hey, the game is gonna be awesome, huh? Hey, imagine being one of these mobile game artists that's worked on like all kinds of anime gotcha games, Genshin Impact and shit like that. And then on your resume you also have Tom and fucking Jerry. This is what happens when the East draws the West and it looks amazing. And it's all for a fucking mobile game. Who 
Whew, that took a lot out of me. I think I've had enough Tom and Jerry for one day. Anyway, let me know in the comments if there's other franchises you'd like me to look at. Video games based on cartoons is my favorite thing to do. And that's the show for the day. Hit me up on Twitter, throw me some money on Patreon or coffee. Just don't hit me physically. Only my parents get to hit me. Bye. Go, go, Gadget. Click off the video as soon as you hear my horrible voice. Inspector Gadget. I mean, what do you want me to say? Probably nothing can get to the review, right? Join the fucking club. It was quite possibly Deke Entertainment's most successful TV show and pretty much became Deke's mascot. The show started in 1983 featuring Don Adams from Get Smart, a show that was about a bumbling agent that somehow completes missions. And that's Gadget to a T. He gets into shit, shit happens, but somehow shit gets done, thanks to his niece Penny and her dog Brain, who do most of the heavy lifting behind the scenes. Deke was very proud of Gadget, giving him TV specials, spin-offs, movies, and animated movies. In fact, he's even appeared on the Super Mario Super Show twice, once on the short Defective Gadgetry, and again in The Treasure of Sierra Brooklyn, both times played by Maurice LaMarche, who later replaced Don Adams after he retired in 1999. Needless to say, it was a pretty popular IP, so of course it had to have video games. How do you not be a successful TV show and not have a single video game? The Raccoon? And with that said, y'all get ready to lay down some brown bricks because it's time to play Inspector Gadget games. Technically, the first Gadget game was Inspector Gadget Circus of Fear on the ugh, Commodore 64, made by Beam Software, which as I said in the Tom and Jerry review, was famous for making literal shit on a stick. Apparently, there's two versions of this game. One we didn't get, and this is the version we did get. And I can tell you right now, the version we got is ruptured hemorrhoids. The first thing I noticed immediately is you can't move straight up and down. You have to move up and down diagonally. So when you go up, you always go up and right. When you go down, you go down and left. Why the fuck would you program it like that? I mean, seriously, what was their reasoning? Oh, the game isn't bullshit enough. Better fuck up the control. Whoever programmed this game must have went on to work for Apple. From what I can tell, you're supposed to find your gadgets by searching all over the stage. But they're not in plain sight. No, that would be too easy. You have to bump up against everything and use the look function. So you press the fire button to look, right? No! You press fire and down at the same time. It specifically wants fire and down at the same exact precise time. Not one button and then the other. Other. Only then will you look, and if it didn't find anything, you get no notification, no nothing. If you do, then an item appears on the bottom, which as far as I know, you can't use. The menu will let you select it, but I have pressed all four directions and the fire button, and nothing happens. So we have a gadget game where you can't even use his gadgets. Great fucking game. 10-10 would take this game home and let it skull fuck me in the eye socket. Absolute Commodore 64 classic right here. I swear, the people who say that the Commodore 64 is an iconic game system have Stockholm Syndrome. That's all they grew up with, so they didn't know anything better than that. Let's play something else before I have an aneurysm. This next one is called Inspector Gadget Global Terror on MS-DOS, and the intro sounds like this. <laughs> Have you ever heard music that sounded drunk? Oh, 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 oh. Right away, Chief. Don't get your hopes up. There's only three sound effects in this whole game. Oh, oh boy, it's a point and click. Scrape my balls with a cheese grater. I hate me some point and clicks. The good news is this is not that awful, honestly. It's extremely linear. You never have to backtrack. And it damn near explains every puzzle for you. No, really, you can call Chief Quimby and he'll literally tell you how to solve the puzzle. It's pretty obvious this is a babby game. It does follow the show pretty damn well, though. It's like you're in an episode of the show. The story is Dr. Claw captured members of the United Nations and Gadget has to save them. And just like the show, Brain uses disguises to get past mad agents, Penny gets kidnapped and uses her computer book to escape, and Gadget remains oblivious to everything going on around him and is apparently a male Karen? So for a point-and-click game, this one offends me the least. There's some pretty interesting scenes in this game. Like, there's this one scene where there's a United Nations guy you gotta save, but he's brainwashed by Dr. 
claw. Bozo Gadget Coat. He steps out of it and the mad agent tries to grab him, but this happens. Now we know why the elephant wouldn't eat that stuff. He was waiting for a nut. <laughs> Looks like he finally got one. A mad nut! <laughs> Even Gadget knows it's funny. Damn, mad nut. <laughs> that alone made this game worth playing. You won't find Adobe here in Nairobi. Let me tell you something. This geographical map was made at a weird time. Instead of Russia, it says Commonwealth of Independent States. I had to look that up. I thought this meant that Moscow identifies as Russian. And Hong Kong used to be owned by the UK? I didn't know that. And I don't care. Excuse me, sir. Can I touch your monkey? I promise I won't blame in the butt. Oh, bad touch, monkey. Bad touch. Piece of shit, dog. You just sat there and watched that happen. I hope you get canine COVID. You know, Scrappy Doo wouldn't have let that happen. Checkmate, Scrappy haters. Next, we've got Inspector Gadget Safety Patrol also on do Us? What is this? Oh, it's one of those coloring book games. Gadget, you stupid fuck. What in the hell possessed you to put iron crosses on your wall? That is so tacky. Why is there smoke coming out of your oven, brain? Oh, oh, I, I don't like that at all. Go, go, Gadget, cock! This is my favorite one. Remember, kids, if drugs don't give you brain damage, Inspector Gadget will. Die, you goddamn suck of a bitch. No, Gadget, don't do it. Go, go, Gadget, suicide. That's enough of this. This barely counts as a game. Now they're the real meat and taters of this review. Inspector Gadget on Super Nintendo. Two words, kill me. I cannot describe the roller coaster of emotions I went through playing this pitiful garbage excuse for a Super Nintendo game. I ran out of air. Have you ever eaten a cake that was expired? You look at the cake and it seems fine. And at first bite or so, it's not that bad. But then that third bite hits you with a taste that you immediately recognize as something wrong. You spit it back out and bear witness to the mushroom kingdom hiding inside Inside this decaying food stuff, and no matter how many times you wash your mouth out, you never really forget the texture. And that's the story of why I can't eat cake anymore. Gadget on Super Nintendo is an expired cake. At first I noticed how you have all these gadgets you can use to get to new areas, and the stage seems easy enough, so I start thinking, hell, this might be good. And then I bit into the green shit. <laughs> The first problem is you can only take two hits, just like ghosts and goblins, and you even lose your clothes on the first hit. And a lot of the enemies take a hell of a lot of hits. And there's some areas in the game I swear the game is trolling you. Stop, stop, we already did that one. Guys, I can't relay to you how much I hate this game. I keep putting off and putting off making this video because I don't even want to look at this footage. Come on, die. Just die. Just fucking die. Just, ah! Okay, gotta build up momentum on the spring. Gotta spring up higher and higher. Come on, get over that wall. Get over that wall. Your mother! And all the way back to the start I go. Yes, found the checkpoint. All right. Oh, it's okay. It's okay. I'm at the checkpoint. This is when the game really started showing its true colors. You have to jump up these platforms while wind physics are moving you around and helicopters are throwing projectiles and charging at you. This part of the game was bullshit with a capital everything. I swear it would be easier to rebuild an engine with soccer boppers on your hands. Remember them things? And I dated myself again. Game over, but luckily you have continues, but they start you at the beginning of the stage, which was hard enough. I felt like I accomplished the impossible just getting to the checkpoint. And those damn helicopters, man, get the fuck out of here. Damn it! Look, it's one thing to have wind physics moving you around. It's another thing Thing to have flying enemies that throw projectiles, but to have both of this at the same time? I think at some point they just forgot it was supposed to be a kid's game and just decided to make it bullshit difficult. I must have played this level over and over again, and I never could get past this one spot with the two helicopters at the top. So you know what? Just to spite this game, we're putting in cheat codes. Here we go, invincibility and skip to the next level. Fuck you, game. Now we're in a clock tower, Still trying to go upwards, but now we don't have that stupid wind anymore. My main problem now is I keep getting on these slippery platforms that keep making me fall down. I must have fell off this damn platform about 10 times.
Oh look, it's the Pendulum of Doom. What's the Pendulum of Doom doing here? Anyway, this boss is hard even with the cheats because you still have knockback even though you're invincible and you can fall down and still die. And then you have the fourth level, which is the epitome of bullcrap because of the- Monkey! These- Ah, oh, God forsaken monkeys! They throw apples at your ass and then knock you off the platform. They kept knocking me on this inner tube down here, and you have to jump from the far right corner of the inner tube to get on the platform because it's just far enough away to be a problem. Fucking monkeys, fucking shit flinging bastards. You wanna touch my monkey? Yeah, I wanna punch it in the fucking face. This game makes me wanna punch animals. And finally, we have work. World 5, which is where I gave up. Ooh, let me tell you about the guy with the rocket launcher. He flies all around throwing rockets at you. The rockets are super fast and you would swear they are guided. This one right here is in the perfect spot to knock you back and make you fall down. And unless you've cooked up some kind of strategy, he'll do it every time. I have actually run through all my lives because of this one enemy alone. And if you do survive him, he starts flying all around throwing more rockets at you. And there's another one behind him. This part of this stupid ass piece of shit game is so fucked. Go, go, gadget, fuck yourself. What? Wait a minute, what's going on? I'm still alive down here. What the fuck? Is it because I'm invincible? I've been dying all these other times. Why didn't I die this time? I'm walking under the stage. Oh, I apparently found a bonus stage down here. Uh, I have the feeling I'm not supposed to be down here yet. The Rocket Man killed me so hard I went into purgatory. Rocket Man, no one fucking likes you. Die alone. I didn't think I'd find something I hated more than the poles in the Grinch, but this is it. And that's when I shut the game off and I will never ever play that again. Inspector Gadget Operation Mad Cactus on the Game Boy Color. Okay, elephant in the room. What is an Ubi key? Is that some Ubisoft DRM? Close. Well, basically Ubisoft would hide a key somewhere in the game. And if you found it, the game would save the fact that you found it. And if you just happen to have another friend with a Game Boy Color that has this game and has also found this key, you can transfer the keys via the infrared thing on a Game Boy Color, and somehow that unlocks a secret level. Is that not the most convoluted bullshit you ever heard in your damn life? So here's the deal. There's an evil cactus company owned by Mad that's making all these crazy cactus monsters, and Gadget is sent to the Cactus Factory to stop them on an island called Owu Iwu. Are you sure they don't make fursuits in Owu Iwu? This is another one of those games that gives you a hundred freaking tutorials to go through. The exit arrow shows you the way out. You don't say. And I'm I'm not joking about the tutorials neither. Watch this. See, there's one tutorial. Keep watching, keep watching. I did not edit that. After the tutorial, there's a tutorial. I fucking hate tutorials. So this one actually lets you play as Penny or Brain if you want to. Penny can hack computers and swim, and Brain can double jump. Penny and Brain can only take two hits, though, and Gadget can take multiple ones. Any character can collect ammo for the gadgets. The gadget copter is pretty nice because it's fast, but that does also mean you can accidentally bump into enemies, but that's more of a you problem, not the game. In some stages, you need to find a marked area on the map to drop a bomb at, and then you can head to the exit. I don't have much to say about this game, honestly. It's not that bad. The levels can be a little confusing at times because everything kind of looks the same, but that's why they gave you the exit arrows, I guess. But I do have a couple minor gripes. The computer hacking. It's it's pipe dream, basically. If you played Bioshock, you've played this. It just feels like a tedious waste of time. I don't hate it, I just don't care for it. Then there's a stage where you have to get to the top real fast because there's insta-kill water rising up to insta-kill you. And it rises really fast, so you need to be quick about where you're going or have a good memory of the stage to get to the top fast enough. Again, it's not pissing me off, it's just a frustrating level is all. I don't know, I guess I feel like I should go easy on this game because for one thing, it's a Game Boy game, and it's the first gadget game so far that doesn't make me dry heave. Seriously, compared to the Super Nintendo game, this is a fucking capasso. However, this level had the one instance where a tutorial killed me. I picked up a weapon I'd never got before. The tutorial popped up and it canceled my jump. 
That is the first time a tutorial has ever killed me in a game. Tutorials. Inspector Gadget Advanced Mission on the Take a Fucking Guess Advance. At least in this one, you get the tutorial at the beginning of the game, and then they leave you alone. Froggy went a courtin' and he did ride a c c c c c camel. Why is it Froggy went a courtin'? Froggy with fries draws hentai of your mom. Oh shit. Oh god. I gotta make fun of my friends sometime. Guys, do you know what it means when a game has a smell? This smells like GBA. We have ugly compressed JPEG sprites, stupid music, a franchise license. If it was only isometric, it would complete the quartet of shit that is Game Boy Advance games. I can't be mad at this one. It makes me happy. It makes me laugh. Anyway, this game is a lot like the Game Boy Color game. In fact, it's made by the same people. Only this time they got rid of the exit arrows. So these maps feel extremely convoluted. And you are left to your own devices to figure out where the hell you're supposed to go. The perspective doesn't make sense on some of these sprites neither. I don't know if something's in the background or in the foreground. I will say this is definitely worse than the Game Boy Color game. Because I just, I can't figure out where I'm supposed to go. I never know if I'm making progress or backtracking. It would help if everything didn't all look the same. What is this supposed to be? A bank vault full of money and gold or a refrigerator full of food? Either way, it's very hilarious that that's something you pick up in the game. An entire bank vault refrigerator. What sealed the deal for me, though, is that I got the gadget coat and I started going up and up and up and I just steadily went up and up and up. I thought I was going to hit the ceiling here, but I went through the platform. You see, this game doesn't make any sense perspective-wise. And then I found this checkpoint here, and I jumped, and then I realized I was going down and down and down and down and down. Oh, fuck. And then landed in my starting position. Nah, bro, I'm good. PlayStation, yeah, come on, man. I believe in you, holy PlayStation. Oh, that is such a blue ball. Fucking great value gadget theme. And what is this music? Fucking chill gadget tunes to study to. Uh, is Mad Cat okay over there? Has he got Lockjaw? Oh no, Dr. Claus stole the Chaos Emeralds. All right, time to see what this game's all about. Don't disappoint me, PlayStation. D excuse me? P pardon what? Partial dinnerware? It's a puzzle. It's a pu- Why is it a 2D puzzle game? They have all the power of the PlayStation 1, and this is what they make? I'm pretty sure I've even seen a puzzle game exactly like this. It's one of those puzzle games where you have to match three of the thing to clear the thing. I'm not even gonna lie. I suck at this shit. I can't even tell you if these are well-made puzzles or not, because I legitimately am not good enough at these kind of games to tell you that. Okay, yellow one's clear- I just blocked myself out of that gate. Well, fuck the gate. Let's do the red ones. Let's do the red ones. Okay, get this guy. Push this fu- Oh, for fuck's sake. At this point, I'm gonna start putting triangles in a square hole. This game is not fun to play. In fact, let's talk about the word play. Play means you are engaged in an amusing activity. Well, this is not amusing. I am not engaged, and it's not much of an activity. This does not feel like play. It feels like the opposite of play. And what's the opposite of play kids work this feels like work to play this game feels like a job wait playing games kind of is my job yeah because i got laid off from my job and not a penny to my name i need to bring back the theme song how many games have we got left oh just two more oh thank god i was getting sick of this video you know i have to turn my ac off to make these videos i sweat my 260 pound dump truck of an ass off i know i look slim for a coyote i hide the fat folds in my hat now, Europe actually got two Inspector Gadget games that we didn't get in the U.S. Mad Robots Invasion and Gadget and the Gadgetinis, both of them on PS2. Let's look at Mad Robots Invasion first. I can't help but wonder if the gadget coat was somebody's sexual awakening. Go, go, Gadget DeviantArt! Look, Brain, the Statue of Liberty! Oh, these graphics! Look at the graphics, they're awesome! <laughs> That's a walk cycle. The Statue of Liberty must be on the edge of the earth. Ah! Well, they're dead. Also, Brain has a penis for a tail. Oh, I 
I thought the audio glitched. That was supposed to be the boat. Well, I wonder who could be playing tennis around here. Jeez, I sound more like Gadget than he does, and I'm an inbred hick. And now, let's go. I must save Penny and Brain. You know how sometimes your voice will sound like you're reading something? That's Gadget right now. We got a two and a half D platformer this time around. Is this one going to be any good? No! It's okay. It's decent enough, but it's not going to blow you away or anything. Honestly, the best thing about it is the gadget hammer because you walk up to people and you give them a fucking brain hemorrhage. Go, go, gadget hammer! Gadget, you fucking murdered that man in cold blood. Maybe he was telling him to say no to drugs. You'll go to hell and you'll die. Your gadgets are items you'll pick up as you need them. Work those legs, gadget inspector. Go, 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 gadget legs! Whoa, 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 whoa. Ah! Buy my gadgets! Buy your gadgets? What does that mean? Are they for sale? Might as well say buy your toys and merchandise. How do I keep finding this stuff? This is another game I really don't feel good making fun of because when it's fun, it's fun. But when it's bullshit, it's really fucking bullshit. Like in this level where you're having to jump on conveyor belts and dodge boxes at the same time. <laughs> And here's where I put on my waders because the bullshit gets real thick right here. Let me slow that down. There's a platform high up I need to jump on, but this little piece of ceiling is just right to be wrong. And when I jump over there, I hit that ceiling and it knocks me down. This happened more than a few times too. It was pretty aggravating. Even when I did jump over it, the model acted like it didn't know what to do. It kind of bobbed me around for some reason. The bosses are bullshit. They're pitiful and bullshit. This one throws rockets at you and the way you hurt this boss is by trying to make the rockets hit the the spot he's standing in and the only way to do that is to stand as close to him as possible for one thing he keeps moving and another thing the rockets fall down really fast so you don't have time to react it's a good thing you have a long life bar because you're gonna take a lot of hits the london level is the one that finally made me rage quit though there's this part where you're running on the road and there's cars coming at you and you don't see or hear the cars until they're already a flies pecker size length towards you and again you have no time to react there seems to be a pattern here somehow. And then there's these rocks you gotta jump on that they made slippery for some reason? And then there's the murder of crows that try to murder you. What would be someone's reaction to seeing somebody beat the shit out of crows with a hammer? Remember that scene in We're Back where the bad guy is getting stalked by the crows and then the one crow comes down and the rest of them come down and then they cover him up and they fucking eat the guy alive? You remember that scene? That was cool. And then there's this asshole. And then I stopped saying, and then. This boss drops bombs on the ground, and the only way to hurt him is to let him get hurt by his own bombs. But there's no real good way of doing that. They expect you to jump over him so he'll stop for a moment, I guess. But the thing is, you have to kind of learn how long the bombs take to blow up and try to time your jumping over him just right to where when he starts running at you again, a bomb will blow up on him. But damned if I can make that happen. It even seems like when I jump over a bomb that's exploded, I still take damage. And it's just so bad. It's so fucking bad. It's bad. It's just fucking... Oh. Oh. I hate it. And I have run out of steam for this video. I can't be mad. I can't be sad. I can't be nothing but just aggravated that I'm still making this video. At this point, I just want to get it over with. So let's look at this one last game and then move on with our lives. This is Gadget and the Gadgetinis for PlayStation 2. God, I don't even care anymore. This looks amazing, what the fuck? Whoa, dude, check that out. Did they actually try and give a shit? They tried! They tried! Let me get a drink right quick.
I do not have enough Java Monster for this. Could this be it after all this garbage, the diamond in the rough that we didn't get in the US? Well, let's have a look. So Gadget and the Gadgetinis was apparently a TV show, a spinoff from 2002 that we didn't get in the US. Now Gadget works for a secret agency and he has new sidekicks that replaced Brain because Brain ran away from home? You literal piece of dog shit. And this is the video game for it. Now granted, the graphics don't look all that special. It's typical cheap PS2 game. But I'm willing to look past that because there's a lot this game does right. First, you get these cheap cutscenes with this French guy, which I guess replaced Chief Quimby. Spreading a gas throughout Las Vegas that makes people go crazy. That's not a gas, that's 5G. So let me start up with- Whoa, 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 hold up, hold up, hold up. Is- is he- is he doing the- No, no, it's 2002. It wasn't even invented yet. Well, that's gonna be an emote on the Discord server. Here's our gadget communicator. Why are you talking like a British person, Gadget? All throughout your mission, whenever a new dilemma arises... Shit, talk about British. Penny is farting tea and crumpets over here. So the great thing about this game is you already have all your gadgets and you can use them all at any time. And you know what? That's all I asked for. Punching feels really satisfying in this game because his gadget arms shoot out really far and you can reach somebody from way down yonder. And if you collect enough of these boxing glove coins, you can upgrade the punch and make it even better. There's something kind of weird with his wall. He kind of floats in place for a half second, then starts the walk animation. It's funny. Use the jump button while moving with the left analogistic. <laughs> the what? The analogistic? Hey, hey, British folk, y'all don't really call it that, do you? Boy, I'll have a pull on me analogistic. You want my... I'm so glad I played this game. Let's just unpack everything here. We've got Pogging Gadget, we've got British Gadget, we've got Analogistic, and we've got solid mechanics and controls like this game was actually made by people who gave a fuck. The only thing that would make this the ultimate game is if I could spam voice clips. <laughs> Well, that tears it. I love this game. But for real, what do I like about this game? Well, the level design is really nice for one thing. They keep throwing new stuff at you every level, which is what you want in a game. You don't want the same old shit on every damn level. You need variety, and this game has it, plus a lot of gadgets to maneuver through it with. You've got the gadget copter, you've got magnetic shoes, you've got telescoping arms and legs, an umbrella to glide with, and the gadget coat, which reflects projectiles back towards the enemy. There's many games where you play as the gadgetini themselves and one has a laser and one has a rocket launcher. You use them to kill all the enemies in the arena. I do feel like these sections kind of get in the way of my fun playing as Gadget, but I don't mind it enough to say I hate it. That said, would I say it's a good game? Well, compared to the other shit we played today, this is mashed potatoes and pussy and they both go good with gravy. Try it. And if your PC can handle PS2 emulation, I say go get it. It is the one and only good Inspector Gadget game. And if I had to end on a high note, this is it. And that is all the Inspector Gadget games that I'm going to review. Get out of here. I have slaved over this video for so long. It is now 12 p.m. and I'm going to bed. Tell fuck it, I'll go to sleep right here. Did, did I ever mention Dixie? I, I never mentioned Dixie, not once. Here she is. I wonder if anybody ever took up on the offer about drawing my Sona as a girl. That'd be funny. Look, I don't care at this point, okay? I'm losing money left and right, my antipsychotics ain't working today, a dog just turned over my trash can, and nobody's buying my Dixie NFT. Come on, you've got 250000 in your back pocket. Give me! So needless to say, I don't feel like reviewing garbage games I don't care about. So today, you're going to sit there, you're going to watch this video, and I'm going to review games from a series that I actually give a shit about. This video's for me, not you. If it gets zero views, it gets zero views. I need this. I need games about what most people consider the worst Disney afternoon cartoon, but to me was my childhood. Bonkers. So what the hell is bonkers? Well, it's complicated. 
But basically, Bonkers was a show that was supposed to be a show about Roger Rabbit, but after a whole bunch of copyright bullshit that never got figured out, the creators said fuck it and made their own show with a similar idea to Roger Rabbit and that cartoons and humans lived together. Bonkers started out as a set of shorts on a show called Raw Tunage and then became its own show. Bonkers himself is a bobcat voiced by Jim Cummings, who is a police officer that takes care of crime and cases pertaining to cartoons. There's two different seasons of Bonkers where he has a different partner, Lucky Piquel or Miranda Wright. The reason for that is its own story, but basically Bonkers is a cop tunes call when they need help. Now, I was gonna go into this big thing about how much I love this show and how I think it still holds up today, but then I realized I haven't watched it since I was a kid, so I watched it again. And holy shit, I got a severe migraine after only two minutes. Dear God, was it always that annoying? It's like way too fast-paced with a bunch of screaming and ranting random tunes gibberish. I have to say, I definitely don't like it anymore, and don't know why I liked it as a kid. That was just a bunch of cartoons having gay sex. Oh well, I still like Bonkers himself, and he was a part of my childhood. Hell, he's the reason Dixie is a bobcat. It's all this little fucker's fault. But enough about the show, we're here to talk about the games, and that is going to be extremely easy for me, because there's only three Bonkers games, so I only have to suffer three times. Now I know what you're all thinking. Bubsy is a bobcat too. Does Bonkers have better games than Bubsy? Do rednecks fuck their cousins? Bonkers on the Super Nintendo. Oh boy, Sonic 3D Blast was on the Super Nintendo and that was great. And you know what? This game is freaking awesome. You know why? Because it's a Capcom game. The same people that made Gotcha Force. The Nobody? Oh. So a bunch of Toon treasures were stolen from a museum, and Bonkers has to go out and kick some Toon ass and plow some Toonussy. This game is a simple 2D platformer, and it doesn't claim to be anything else but that. You got a dash attack that you can charge up, and also bombs that you can throw. The main way you attack is you jump on an enemy's head. You've got hit points that can be increased by finding hearts throughout the level. They increase your maximum health. Sometimes you can find a potion to drink that gives you infinite dash and invincibility. And I'm not doing a very good job at showing it off. Oh, look, it's the candle dildo guy from Beauty and the Bestiality. Time to meet Jesus. Hey, what's this say? Abab, 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 abab. All right, it's boss time. Wait a minute. I know this fucking music. This is that music that was on that Pokemon bootleg. In fact, this game has a lot of the same sound effects. The bootleggers ripped off bonkers. I can't believe that. Anyway, this boss is a ghost and he takes over items in the room. One of them has a spike on its head, so you'll have to dash to hit it. Then he turns into his normal body and throws something at you. And it's really hard to dodge and you have a very small window of time that you can jump on his head. And it's near impossible to do and I ended up dying. Luckily, when you come back, your bombs are full. So now I can just hurl bombs at him, and now the boss is extremely easy. So I guess if you have no bombs, you're just fucked. The controls feel really nice in this game, and they should. It's a Capcom game. You expect controls nice and tight, like some good pussy, and I'm a cunning linguist. The levels all exhibit a perfect balance of fairness and challenge, though a bit on the easy side, except for one level, which I'll discuss later. But what makes me happy is what this game does not do. It does not have up to jump, it doesn't have one life and no continues, and there's no annoying character popping up every five seconds telling you how to play the game. Unlike some some of Capcom's other games. But there's also no guy punching a boulder, so minus one point for that. There are some cheap deaths now and then, though. Oh, that's just dirty. I like Bonkers' walk cycle. He looks like the happiest little shit in the world. Look at this shit they pulled here. They put a one-up and a bomb down here for you to collect, but they put a cactus at the end so you'd get hurt. That's like giving a kid an apple and putting a razor blade in it, which I tend to do. Next boss, and it's a couple of bird guys. Oh. Well, I guess I'll get fucked then. That conveyor belt's the real boss of this level. So the idea is you have to knock one of them off the conveyor belt, and then you gotta knock the other one off the spotlights and then off the conveyor belt. But the whole time he's throwing bombs and banana peels at you. This boss isn't too hard. The worst part about it is waiting for your dash to charge back up so you can hit the button and knock the spotlights down. Not too hard at all. Can be done fairly easily. I wonder where those bottomless pits go in games. Are the enemies just forever falling in limbo? Dude, this is a totally... Deep hole. 
Yeah! This level kind of pissed me off because there's neon signs that are in the way and they shock you if you touch them. And then, and then, baby, baby, baby. And in some instances, it's really hard to avoid them because they don't stand out. They just look like some of the scenery, but they put them all over the place and it's so easy to touch them. When you game over, you get sent to this screen where you have to laugh at this guy's joke in order to get it continue. Did you hear the one about the guy who put instant coffee in the microwave? He went back in time. I I, I don't get it. I think I could come up with a better joke. The existence of a power shovel implies the existence of a submissive hoe. <laughs> Bonkers has the energy of a submissive hoe, but he could be a power shovel for all I know. You know what? Let's go to Fur Affinity. First thing I see is inflation. I hate the internet. Why can't you people have normal fetishes like paws? Paws never hurt nobody. This handbag has a fetish for being a little shit. He moves around so fast it's hard to get a good shot at him with my bombs. Seriously, fuck these handbags. They were such a nuisance. Na nuisance? It ain't bad enough you're a nuisance, you're a na nuisance. Then there was this part where I was on a road and I had to hop on top of cars and watch out for signs. And I kept smacking into the signs. <laughs> The next big boss I had to fight was a helicopter, helicopter. The helicopter was tricky. I had to try to hit him with a bomb before he would use an attack, or else he would shower me with bombs. Then there was this other guy, I don't know what his problem was. But after enough bombs, the helicopter fucked off. Then I go to this other level where I get bombarded by birds with brown eggs. They're literally throwing their unborn children at me. This would be the equivalent of a pregnant woman throwing her funky fetus at me. This freezer section right here brings you death in 36 flavors. You've got penguins that charge at you, you've got frozen swordfish that drop down on you, and you've got gas pipes. It's good to know that everything around you wants to kill you. The very air you're breathing could have cancer cells in it right now. You may be dying as we speak. While the cancer slowly kills you from the inside, a piano falls on your head, huh? <laughs> This may have been the easiest boss in the whole game. You hit him, he blows wind at you, you walk back up to him, throw another bomb at him, and that's it. You know, you would think at some point doing this thing over and over, he would think, you know, this ain't working, maybe I should try something else, but no. Truly the definition of insanity. So here's the obligatory sewer level. The sewer level can eat a dick. I got stuck in this one little spot with this alligator and I couldn't figure out how to get back out again. Luckily when I respawned, it put me somewhere else. Oh, I haven't mentioned this guy yet. This is Fall Apart Rabbit. He's from the show. If you hit him with a bomb, he gives you a one-up. If you physically abuse your friend, you get free stuff. Also, you can travel through these pipes. This part sucks. The current is moving you around. You have to jump over to the other side, but the current is making your jump slower. And sometimes you'll jump so slow you can't make it over to the other side. This whole damn level just pissed me off something fierce. Shit, I wish I was doing something fun right now, like listening to Crocus. Don't get me wrong, I like this game. But this is the weakest level in the game, and I can't stand it. But what I hate the most is these damn switches that you have to dash on. So these switches open a door, but only for a short period so you have to haul ass to get over there to the door and it gives you just barely enough time to make it there's current in this water and i have to dash and jump up to hit the switch but half the time i try it it doesn't work like what the hell why won't it let me hit the switch i don't know what the hell i'm doing wrong but every time i try to dash on this switch it doesn't work and then finally just somehow it just magically works i still don't know what the hell was up with that but it just adds to the whole thing of this is the only level that gave me any real trouble. And then this shit. There's shit falling from the ceiling. The floor is crumbling. There's enemies trying to kill you. It's all together not a Merry Brady Christmas. So this time I try to be careful. I dash across here. I stop for a moment, let the things fall down. Then I dash again. And oh no, I bump into one enemy and another kills me. I ran out all my lives twice trying to do this shit. What a horrible level this is in such a perfectly good game. Now I gotta hear more of his shitty jokes.
jokes. What's the last thing that goes through a bug's mind when it hits the windshield? His hind legs. Man, you're about as funny as a funeral. After those jokes, I could watch Hachiko and laugh my ass off. And after you get past that, you need to get past these dudes on these little buckets that look like those little things from Mega Man, probably on purpose. Then you fight this guy who seems just like a Robotnik boss fight. You have to throw bombs at him and then jump on that red thing on top of the robot. Do that a few times and you got him. Now the game makes you think that this guy is the final boss, but it turns out he's not. You've got one more stage and one more boss to do. This stage has got a bunch of springy things that throw you around like a fucking frisbee, but you can use them to your advantage to speed run through the stage. Just look how far it throws me, man. That needs to be a mode of transportation. Something just slingshoots you to where you want to go. The good news is this stage is really short and you get to the final boss really quick. With this boss, he holds his hands up and you got to get to the side where he's not holding his hand up so you can throw a bomb in his face. But through all that, you gotta dodge lightning, lasers, the debris he throws when you hit him, and the enemies that keep spawning. It's a long, grueling fight to keep stuff from flying in your face. But it can be done, and it probably can be done quite easily. You defeat him, he gives back the treasures, but he says he's going to stop time forever. But Bonkers keeps him from doing that by saying thank you for giving back the treasures. And he changes his mind, and thus Bonkers saves the fucking world. And with that, that is the end. End of Bonkers for the Super Nintendo. It's a great game, solid 3 out of 5. Check that shit out, man. But we are not done yet, because there are two more Bonkers games. Now there's a lot less to say about these, so we can cut these out pretty quick. Bonkers on the Sega Genesis was developed by Sega themselves, and is altogether a different game. This game is actually a collection of four different mini-games. The first one's got you throwing donuts at enemies to make sure they don't get close to the treasures in front of you. You just move left and right, throw all the donuts until you kill all the enemies. Each minigame has 10 stages, and somewhere in the middle of all that, you get to do a bonus stage. Uh, pretend I didn't do that. After the 10th stage, you get a little animation of you capturing the boss. You don't actually fight the boss? That's kind of shit. That's like a Mario game where you don't fight Bowser. Or a Metal Gear game that doesn't leave you sexually confused. The second stage is something shooting shit at you and you gotta build a wall to cover it up. That's right. We're gonna build a massive wall all around Hollywood and keep that chunk out of our country. You get the fuck out of here, you fucking Hollywood sons of bitches. Well, it's obvious I suck at impressions. Anyway, you wall this guy up like Henry from Thomas the Tank Engine. That's the end of that. Okay, let's try this bonus stage again and see if I can, like, not die. I'm so good at games! There's really no challenge to this at all. You just build a wall. They should have give you, like, a time limit or something to make it more challenging. This is kind of boring. And it ain't much different from the donut throwing level. And it's over just as soon as it began. Why don't you build a wall around some bitches? The third one has you putting together pieces of Fall Apart Rabbit so he can defuse a bomb. You have to bash these crates to find the pieces. Now, some of the crates will jump to tell you that there's a piece in it. But this game has a difficulty set. So I wonder if this game doesn't do that in the harder difficulties. There's also rats. Oh no, not rats. And there's also Jack in the Boxes that try to kill you. Guys, is it Jack in the Boxes or is it Jacks in the Box? Or would Jacks in the Box imply that there's several Jacks inside one box? Or maybe it's both. It's Jacks in the Boxes. That's gonna keep me up tonight. The last one is this Spy Hunter shit where you have to try to crash the other cars. Some of them you can stop by using this cartoon gum that sticks them to the road, but some of them you have to use oil slick or literally crash into them. Then after you crash all the cars, you have to fight this tow truck at the end. And once you defeat him, the stage is over. I'd say this was the most fun out of all the mini games, but that's not saying much. It's like doing your taxes is more fun than going to jail. But there is something oddly satisfying about smacking into the other cars. Honestly makes me want to play Burnout. I'm Burnout on this game. But you know the good news? This is the last stage. There's no fifth stage. There's no final boss. Once you beat all the mini games, you won the game. And that's bonkers on the Sega Genesis. It's over as soon as it began. It's not bad. It's just not as good as the Super Nintendo one. And it's really lacking in content. Last game, bonkers wax up on the Sega Game Gear. This will be the first time we've played a Game Gear game on this channel. So you run around this level collecting 
pickles, I assume? And you have to find all of them to go to the next stage. I'm sure this makes a whole lot more sense if I had the manual. But then again, Bonkers was always pretty nonsensical. I would have more to say about this game if there was more to say about this game. It's kind of boring, honestly. You run around collecting pickles. There's a radar on the pause menu that tells you where they are. Don't get hit by the enemies. That's it. I mean, I'll give it a little bit of slack. It's a Game Gear game, so I shouldn't expect very much out of it. And, <clears throat> you know, personally, I have pretty high standards when it comes to video games. <clears throat> Says the man that likes Biomutant. This gave me a good chuckle, though. Oh my goodness, this is awful! And that is the Bonkers games. They only ever made three. I hope you didn't mind me just indulging in something that I cared about. If you did, don't worry, I got some better stuff lined up. Well, if you like what you saw, you ought to consider being a patron. For $5 a month, you get to see the videos before anybody else does. You get your name on the board and you get a Discord. You can also get your name on the board for just $1, and you'll have my absolute thanks if you do. Well, that's it. This is Working Man Games. I'm Stuart K. Riley. Y'all have a good day. Yes, it's time for Flintstones! In 1960, Hanna-Barbera gave the world the Flintstones, an animated sitcom about the day-to-day -day life of Fred, his wife Wilma, and their neighbors Barney and Betty. The show's main hook was that it took place in the Stone Age, and while their world had modern amenities, it was prehistoric takes on them. Like most of their appliances were repurposed dinosaurs or other creatures, a joke that the show ran into the ground on every single episode. The show aired on primetime, which was something no other cartoon had ever done before and the writing of the show was tailored towards both kids and adults, making it one of the earliest cartoons to cater to adults. Yeah, I think I remember some adult jokes, like when Fred hits Barney in the dick with a hammer. Barney, say goodbye to your balls! <laughs> Though by no means the first cartoon aimed at adults, its impact would later shape shows like The Simpsons and ugh, Family Guy, which is ironic because Seth MacFarlane tried to reboot the Flintstones, but the Fox Network took one look at the pilot script and said hell no. So we dodged a bullet there. Thanks, Fox. I got an erection. For three whole decades, the Flintstones was the world's most financially successful and longest running animated TV series, and TV Guide called it the second greatest TV cartoon of all time. In both of those accolades, it was overthrown by The Simpsons. Here's the thing, though. You see, I think The Flintstones is okay, but that's all. Just okay. I'm sure it was entertaining back in its day, but its day has come and gone. Which makes me think, will a newer generation decades after me find The Simpsons not funny or entertaining? Even the best seasons of it? Maybe it's just evolution and progress. The Flintstones was good, it's just kind of dated now. But enough about the show, let's talk about the games. Now there were several Flintstones games and I'm not gonna play every single one. I picked out the ones which are the most interesting out of the bunch. So let's start our journey on MS-DOS with Dino Lost in Bedrock. <laughs> Yeah, I already used that joke, but it's funny, damn it. This is PC gaming at its finest, children. Oh, wow, you have separate buttons for jumping in a direction. What's Fred doing just standing around in a sewer? There's a lot of prehistoric poop in there that hasn't fossilized yet. You know, it's funny I say that. I used to have a book called Prehistoric Poop, which is apparently so obscure I could only find one little small thumbnail of it. And it's made by a company called Troll. Don't you love that? So the jump is really fucked up in this game. Up is jump as it tends to be in these crappy games. You know, I feel like I've said the phrase up is jump so many times, it's almost become a catchphrase. I should sell a shirt that says up is jump. Uh oh, watch out for the crocodile. Watch out for those. So if you want to jump high, you have to continue holding up and then it'll keep going like a normal jump. Now you press diagonally right or diagonally left and you'll nudge ever so slightly in that direction. And you jump and move so slow too. I know I could turn the CPU speed up, but then the game would look like this. <laughs> The 
This game is completely unplayable anyway. They put so many enemies and a one-hit death that it's just, it's impossible. But it's made by the same people that made the MS-DOS Mega Man port, so I shouldn't expect much. This game feels like it was made in the Stone Age. Next we have the Flintstones on Sega Master System. Now this was put on tons of computers, but the Sega Master System is the one I want to look at because there's a particular scene in this game that became a small meme in a forum I used to be on. <laughs> Oh my god, I love that big crush yabba dabba doo. Ha <laughs> ha, there it is! Fred must paint the wall! Fred must cover the blood spatter! Fred must hide the bodies! Well, I guess I gotta paint this wall. Okay, I'm pushing every button. The wall ain't getting painted. Uh, what do you do? Well, apparently this little guy is the paintbrush. Guess I better get it. Pebbles, you get back in that crib, you little baby fuck. I just noticed that the house has no ceiling. The hell, Fred? You're so broke you can't afford a ceiling? What is this BMF thing about, bitch-ass motherfucker? Apparently every time you pick up Pebbles, you lose your paintbrush and you have to go get it again. Fred, you have two hands! You gotta tell me you can't just grab a baby by the neck so you hold the a button to paint the wall and every time you do you have less and less paint so it covers less surface area so you got to go back to the bucket and get more paint pebbles quit drawing on the wall fucking wilma should have swallowed you you little shit it feels like it takes forever to paint this wall too because not only do you have to paint this bottom part you got to paint the top part too and you got to move this ladder every single time i don't know about you but doing household chores is not something i want to do in a video game but this is just the first level and this isn't all you do. You also got to get to the bowling alley before it closes, which involves a very aggravating level where every time you hit a rock, a wheel falls off your car, then you got to jack up the car, get the wheel, put it back on, and then get back on the road. You have to tap the buttons a certain way to get the jack to work, and I never did really get it right. Put the wheel on. Put the wheel on. God gummit, put the damn wheel on. Come on now. There, there we go. Oh, you are shitting me right now. Yeah, you can jump over the rocks, but then it takes a moment before it'll let you jump again, and then by then, you done hit the other rock. Jump, jump. Oh, that is not fair! I jumped over the rock! I guess if I could say one thing, the more I put this wheel on, the faster I can do it. It's like after a while, you get used to the shit controls. It's that Stockholm Syndrome setting in, getting used to shit. Fred must beat Barney. Shut down. So now I know what this is for, it's for the bowling. And guys, this bowling level takes forever. And it actually took me a while to figure out how to play it. Cause you gotta adjust where you are, what direction you're gonna throw the ball, and then how fast you're gonna throw the ball, and then actually throw the ball. They put way too much effort into this. This could have just been a Flintstones bowling game. This whole thing took me like an hour or so to do. And it took me a lot of practice throws to even get it right. So naturally I was going to lose on my first try. But you have to play the whole thing. Regardless whether or not you've already lost. And guys, I just couldn't do it. I couldn't take it. I guess they didn't really know how to make a Flintstones game. So they just decided to make it like you're playing a day in the life of Fred. You're doing chores. You're going bowling. You do bowling, and then you turn the game off because you can't beat the bowling game. Well, that's enough out of this one. Fred must buy a better game. But therein lies the good news. There are better Flintstones games. Most of the 8 and 16-bit Flintstones games were actually made by Taito, who actually makes pretty decent games. Does that mean I'm gonna go easy on these games? Hell no. So let's start off on the one that you're probably waiting on. Get ready for it, because here it comes. The Flintstones, the rescue of Dino and Hoppy. Oops, uh, wrong ROM. There we go. I don't know if anybody's ever said this, but I think this is a really good 8-bit rendition of the Flintstones theme. I'd say it's right up there with the DuckTales NES intro. So all the main characters are hanging out outside, including Hoppy and Gazoo. I really think it's weird that these characters are in the game, because Hoppy didn't show up till the fifth season and Gazoo was on the very last season. And suddenly this creepy looking guy with a time machine shows up and captures Dino and Hoppy. He plans to go back to the future and take them to the Orbit City Zoo. And if you don't know, Orbit City is where the Jetsons came from. He then destroys Gazoo's time machine and then spreads the pieces all over the world. And now it's up to Fred to get all the pieces and go to the future. Now I knew about this game before it became popular because we had a movie rental place in my town back in the 90s. And I rented this game from there. And I remember I didn't get very far. So playing this game again was like a nostalgia trip for me. And apparently I still suck at it. Your main weapon is your club and you can hold the B button to charge it. And you can get sub-weapons too, which really help with the bosses. 
Some of the bosses are really hard in this game, but some of them you can literally cheese without getting hit. There's this one perfect spot you can get to where you can hit this guy in the head with your sub weapon and not get hit by the flames. And about three hits will take him down. He is way harder to try to kill with the club. They must know that too because they give you the axe right before you get to him. At this point, you get an overworld and you can go wherever you want. There's a bonus basketball game that you can play. And for an NES basketball game, it's surprising fun and it gets more difficult every time you play it but even the most difficult version of it is still pretty easy I bet you that basketball is supposed to be made out of stone how much of a badass do you have to be to dribble a stone ball it's a stone Luigi go touch grass something I thought was weird you know they got two of these kind of bad guys one shoots you and one does not despite the fact it clearly has a gun in its hand it's only the ones that hide in the corners what did they forget to code the other one to shoot you even though this this game can get hard at times, it's extremely fair for the most part. You'll steadily find 1-ups, life hearts, an item that gives you more max hit points, a burger that makes your charge meter bigger, and you get infinite continues, so the game gives you no excuse to not keep trying, which in turn makes the game more fun. It encourages you to keep going. Hey, here's another pushover boss. You just hit him with the stone axe a few times, and when you run out, just do a power charge at him. Now you may see these two boss fights I showed you and think this game is insanely easy. Oh, but there's some real butt breakers. You just keep watching, I'll show them to you. Now one of the main mechanics in this game you'll be using a lot is grabbing on the ledges. Just hold A while you're jumping and you can climb up a ledge by pushing up. What's interesting is that you can climb ledges farther away than you think you can. If you don't think you can jump that far and make it, you probably can. The hitbox is actually bigger than you think, so you can grab ledges that otherwise look out of reach. Blind stew moment, I didn't see the spikes right fucking in front of me. Now you've also got special moves you can do like flying and high jumping and other stuff. Gazoo will give you a list of powers that you can do. And the way you unlock those powers is you play those basketball games. Every time you win you get a new power. Guys, I can't even come up with jokes about this game. It's good. It's an actual decent good game. I like it. I played it all the way through and it's good. But it does have some stuff that bothers me. There was one particular level in this game where I almost gave up. The ice level. Oh. My. God. The person that came up with the ice physics for this game should be drug outside and shot. So when you walk, you start sliding as soon as you let go of the D-pad, which is normal for ice physics, but you slide infinitely. Unless you push the D-pad in the opposite direction, you will slide for all eternity, and it takes a while to stop your momentum. Meaning you have got to be really careful doing platforming. Shit's more slippery than a bad dragon covered in WD-40. Now this part with the rotating platform platforms on the spike ceiling. I watched Joel play this part and he had a lot of trouble with it, but here's how you do it. The trick is you have to fall and then press and hold A to grab onto the ledge. That's a matter of just jumping to the next platform when it's furthest away from the spike ceiling. It's one of those things that looks more difficult than it is. You could use Gazoo's fly ability to get through here, but you run the risk of either hitting the ceiling or running out of coins because the fly is powered by coins. I don't know how Joel, somebody who beat Battletoads and Desert Bus multiple times had trouble with this. I'm just saying. I hope to God he doesn't watch this. Chips are dinner, Joel. This boss is so hard, the NES can't display him correctly. For one thing, he's got a really messed up hitbox. By the time you hit him, he's run into you, and to top it all off, the floor is ice. This boss kicked my ass like I was a crypto miner locked in a room full of PC gamers overloaded on G Fuel. See what I did there? I made a joke my audience can relate to. Laugh, you fucks! The strategy I came up with was standing in one spot instead of running up to him, because that will just get you killed. Then hit him with a charged club shot shot when he gets close and immediately jump. It took a while to get the timing right, but when I did, boy was it satisfying when I took him down. So remember kids, with enough determination you can achieve anything. And save states, lots of save states. There's a castle stage that kind of fucks with you to begin with because there's not that many enemies and you think these skeletons are just cosmetic, but oh no, here they come. There is one bullshit trap where you got the lava coming up and you gotta try to grab onto the ledges and you cannot mess this up. You gotta get it perfect. It's not impossible though, you can do it. There's apparently a spot in this level where you had to fight Frankenstein's monster, but I found a way to skip this part. Well, not before getting stunned after getting hit killed me. Yeah, I can't 
can't do anything. I just gotta watch myself die. So here I can just use the fly superpower and just fly my way over there and skip all that shit. And then you fight, I count Rockula, I guess. Oh shit, that actually is a character. Ain't really much to say about this fight. He goes to one spot, you hit him. He goes to another spot, you hit him again. Rinse, repeat, and it goes on for a long time. This is the longest fight in the game. Then there's a ugh, water level where your deaths are the cheapest of the cheap. Yeah, very nice. I don't know what these are, fish or squids, but they sure do piss me off. This whole level's full of cheap deaths and leaps of faith you have to do to even know where you're going. This bubble platform area sucks ass because every time you jump, you lose sight of the bubbles. I love how the frame rate tanks on this part too. It's like the NES can't handle bubbles. The good news is there's no boss on this level. The level is the fucking boss. It just kind of ends. And then you end up on Asian stereotype land. You know, they did an Asian stereotype on the first season, and he was everything you could imagine he was. You know, the developers of this game was Japanese. I wonder if they saw that episode. This level ain't too bad other than Fred kills an innocent civilian and steals his cart. Yeah, but dab a murder. And then you fight this dinosaur, which I swear all I did was spam the club over and over and I beat him. After that level, you get in the time machine and you go to the final level, Orbit City in the future. And guys, Taito couldn't have handled this better. The first thing you hear when you get to the level is the Jetsons theme song. Oops. <laughs> Oh, uh, let's try that again. This time, don't suck. Well, not only are you greeted by the Jetsons theme song, you're also greeted by George Jetson himself. And he remembers you, because this takes place after the Jetsons meet the Flintstones. I made a YouTube poop of that a long time ago. George, it's Mr. Spacely. Oh, Mr. Spacely, too fuck off. Teacher, fuck off, Mr. Spacely. I spent a fortune romancing Cogswell's asshole just to get probed in my butt. Congratulations, you made it through the unfunniest part of this video. Fuck my wife. I hate to go off subject again, but have you ever seen the Flintstones edit where it's you fuck my wife? It's from the movie Raging Bull. I hear I'll show it. You fuck my wife. What? You fuck my wife. Where do you get your balls big enough to ask me that? Man, she again. Did you or did you not? It's a sick question. You're a sick fuck, and I'm not that sick that I'm gonna answer it. I'm gonna leave. Understand you fucking wacko? Fuck you! Fucking screwball, you. Fuck your mother! Sorry, I just love that video. I love that when you duck, Fred's head just disappears. It's like it goes shroom into the shirt. So the last level is definitely a last level. It throws out all the stops. Everything you think you know about the game is gonna be tested. Oh shit, it's Ed 209! And this is the third video in the row where I've talked about Robocop. I can't escape him, he's everywhere. This is definitely the hardest part, having a platform on these little bitty ass platforms while enemies are trying to kill you. But once you get past it, it's time for the final boss, man. Here it is. It's all led up to this point. So this final boss has three forms. The first form is the one that's hardest to dodge, which sucks because then your life will be way down for the second and third forms. The second form is a joke. You can literally stun lock him to death. Holy shit, it's the Technodrome. Come on, kill him, kill him. Oh, no. It's all about doing that first part right. You can't duck to dodge the missiles, neither. You either gotta jump over them or something. Well, it took a lot of save scumming, but I did not feel like doing that level over again, so... There we go. Die! 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 Dino and Hoppy beat the shit out of the guy. Dino is reunited with Fred, and they all go home and celebrate. And that's where the adventure ends. Well, there you go. If you've always wanted to see the rescue of Dino and Hoppy and what it's all about, there you go. That's the game. But the video isn't over yet. We still got plenty more games to look at. Three years later, Taito would make a sequel to this game, The Flintstones Surprise at Dinosaur Peak. And this must be an ultra rare game or something because this thing goes for insane money on eBay. I saw a sold listing where somebody won the game for $1,700 and it didn't even work. And they're still charging $5 shipping. Man, put free shipping 
tripping on that shit. You probably bought that for 10 bucks at a pawn shop. But here we go. We're about to play that ultra rare game. So Pebbles and Bam Bam go missing and Fred and Barney set out to find them. Now in this game, you can play as either Fred or Barney and choose them by pushing select. Barney has a slingshot that isn't as powerful as Fred's club and he also can't climb ledges. But what he can do is grab onto poles. Ugh, I have a bad relationship with poles. If you want to know why, watch my video about the Grinch. And these poles are their own special kind of bullshit. You can climb up top of them and jump off of them, but you can't walk on them. You have to kind of fiddle around with the A button and up button too to climb up. And half the time it acts like it doesn't want to do it. Like the game is arguing with you. <laughs> This is a reference to something. There, I acknowledged it. They find Pebbles and Bam Bam, but they're separated by lava. And Gazoo says there's a fire dinosaur that can fly them over to Pebbles and Bam Bam and get them. So now the objective becomes get to the fire dinosaur. Other than that, this is pretty much the same game with different levels. And you know what? It's pretty good too. I don't think it's as good as the other one, but it's still a decent game. Overall, it's considerably harder than the last game. This game does not fuck around. It's got those kind of levels where you have to play them and die a few times before you figure out what you're supposed to do. A good example would be right here. You don't see that sign until it's too late. Also, did you notice Yabba Dabba Doo has a trademark on it? Reminds me of Freddy's coming. You can't cheese the bosses in this game. You have to actually try. Some of them have a certain way you gotta kill them, like knocking rocks at him. This surfing level can suffocate from the consumption of my entire ass. There's spots in this level that you have to get absolutely perfect or you're gonna die every time. Let's try that again. Again. Again! You see, what happens is I keep hitting that horse fish or whatever the fuck you call them, and then I get stunned and I can't jump over that platform every single time. You know, the definition of insanity is doing the same thing over and over expecting a different result, and this level drove me insane. I did it! Okay, do not screw- Oh, fuck, oh, fuck! I still got one more life, I still got one more life. Okay. Do not go! Oh, damn it! This level can eat a doggy dick sandwich with mustard and custard. Remember when I said you can't cheese the bosses? I lied. You can cheese this one. Check this shit out. Yo, it's kind of therapeutic after that horrible surfing level I was just in. I could just stand here and spank the monkey. Oh, I'm sorry. I mean spank the monkey. Then there's this level where you're inside a giant kitchen and you have to launch yourself from inside a giant toaster. And you know what they say? No, really. What do they say? The final stage starts kicking your ass ass pretty early on, steadily having to run away from things that are chasing you. You got two final bosses. You got this little dragon guy, and then you got his mama. The first one isn't so bad once you get the timing down, but it's another one of those that seems to go on for eternity. And then you fight mama dragon, and guys, I couldn't do it. I tried. Oh boy, did I try. But she is just too damn tough. You got these boulders, you got these fire projectiles, you got her breathing fire at you. No matter where you get, there doesn't seem to be a safe zone anywhere. And I just had to deem this final boss too tough for me. Somebody out there can beat her, but not me. With all that said, I don't think this game is as good as Dino and Hoppy. But if you like Dino and Hoppy and want to try some more, go emulate this. Now let's go over to the Game Boy with the Flintstones King Rock Treasure Island. Fred finds a treasure map in the quarry and thinks that treasure would be a good anniversary present for Wilma. So Fred goes off to go look for it. This game's got an interesting mechanic in that you can stun enemies and use them as platforms. You can ride Dino just like Yoshi and Dino will let you jump higher. But this game's pretty decent. It makes good use of its core gimmick. The graphics and the levels are kind of stripped down and boring and you do get cheap deaths every now and then. But I do feel like it's one of those games that if you keep your expectations low, you're not going to be disappointed. It is a Flintstones game after all. It's not going to be Super Mario Land 2. The water level is kind of strange in this game in that you still kind of walk and move normal despite being underwater. And anywhere that they could put spikes to annoy you, they did in this level. Good grief. Then there's these spots where there's some fast current going right in the middle of the water. It's really disorienting because you've got this one section in the middle where your jump doesn't act quite right. Then you got spots where the current is bringing you up to the spikes. And then there's this part where you got to stun all the enemies and jump on top of them. And man, this part part is aggravating. Beautiful. 
And then there's this asshole that pissed me off to no end with his stupid rocks and his bobbing head. What a little jackass. He makes me mad just looking at him. Well, then there's a car stage. It reminds me of that damn surfing stage from the previous game. And I died almost instantly on this stage because there's a rock that you hit that I thought was part of the background. I died and game over. And guess what? This game doesn't have unlimited continues. So you gotta start the game all the way the fuck over again. But I don't, because I'm not playing that game anymore. You know what? I take back what I said about it. That game sucked. But we've got another Game Boy game, and it's based on the Flintstones movie, and guess who fucking made this game? Oh boy, when I saw that logo, I knew I was in for some shit. I just got through talking about how terrible ocean games are, so this could only go one way. And guys, I was pleasantly surprised. Okay, first of all, they tried to make it look like John Goodman Fred Flintstone, and this sprite is pretty terrifying. And I had done made up my mind that this game was going to be terrible. But in all God honesty, it was fine. The best way I can describe it is it's inoffensive. It's not going to win any awards, but this was a perfectly serviceable, decent, competent platformer. The boss has kind of confused me to begin with because when they say they've got one more hit point, they actually have two. When the hit points are all gone, they still got one more to go. Kind of a weird design choice, but okay. Every time you beat a stage, you get a random bonus stage that you can play. Like this one where you whack a certain amount of dinos and then you get extra lives. Now you're Barney inside a daycare center where babies can hurt you. What kind of weak little wimp is Barney if babies can hurt him? What, do they claw you with those razor sharp baby fingernails? If you've ever been scratched by a baby, you know exactly what I'm talking about. What, a baby's never scratched you before? The little shits are feral up here. Luckily, you can give these babies a concussion and put them to sleep. Did you know that you can throw a baby off a two-story building and it'll probably live? Can you tell I don't like children? Uh-oh, it looks like the textures didn't load in on this level. Yo, what's with the frog? What's up with this guy? He's got like three heads conjoined together. I shall call you Tom. Now this level, this is pure ocean right here. You have to go around this non-linear level and flip switches in a certain order so you can activate a lift. It's not that bad of a level though, and it's over before you know it. Here's something I thought was kind of weird. There's these secret arcade games you can find where you can play Space Invaders. Now here's why this is weird. Taito made most of the 8 and 16-bit Flintstones games. You know what Taito also made? Space Invaders. But yet this is an ocean game and it has Space Invaders. It's a really odd coincidence. Here's another thing that that bugged me. There's a level in this game that supposedly takes place in ancient ruins, but but this is the Stone Age. So wouldn't they be new ruins or not ruins at all? In fact, doesn't the Stone Age predate ancient Aztec ruins? This level makes no sense whatsoever. It's like making a game about the Old West and the hero drives a Tesla. Dutch, I was charging my iPhone and then I ran the Tesla all out of juice. Arthur, you best be getting an extension cord or I'm gonna wrap it around your neck. Is it me or does that look like John Goodman puking? This game just continues to get stranger and stranger. Some of these levels, I swear, if you change Fred Flintstone's sprite to something else, you would make me believe this is a different game. Oh god, Wilma, what did they do to you? You look like you have a trash bag on your head. I don't have much more to say about this game other than I played the whole thing and even beat the final boss. This was an okay game. It never pissed me off at any point. It really surprises me this is an ocean game. Or is it? As it turns out, Ocean contracted a different company called Twilight to make this game. So even though this was published published by Ocean, they didn't make it. But you know what Ocean did make? The Flintstones on Super Nintendo. Oh boy, this is the real shit right here. Well, at least the graphics look pretty good in this game. Look at that parallax scrolling. That's kind of cool. But oh, it just blinds you to what it's actually going to be. So you got a club in this game like you do the NES games. And there's a lot of input delay to it. And there's way too many animation frames in it. It should just be whack. So trying to actually get it to hit anything's kind of hard. You can also climb ledges like the NES games, but it's really picky about where you can climb it at. Sometimes you'll climb just fine sometimes you need to jump a few times before it'll catch 
not only did they manage to fuck up the animation of the club, but you also can't use the club in the air. You can't club in midair. In the NES games, you could. You know, I feel like if Fred can grab ledges and he's got a club, it almost makes me think that maybe they played the Taito games? And this is kind of a poor representation of what they are. I hate these freaking frogs. They're so hard to hit because the hitbox on the club is fucked up. And they move faster than I can react because the damn controls are so sluggish. And I hate these guys with the stupid boulders. Even when I jump, it still hits me. Grab onto the ledge. Grab onto the ledge. Grab it. Damn. Damn. Oh, God bless America. You know what? I'm not going to give this game any more of my time. I know it's bad. It's an ocean game. Yo, this game over music's pretty good, though. Anyway, let's go back to the Taito games. At least I know those are competent. When it comes to the 16-bit era, that's where Flintstones games peaked. Yeah, you had one bad ocean game, but Taito brought us the Flintstones on Sega Genesis and the Treasure of Sierra Madrock on Super Nintendo. Both of these games get it right all over. On the Genesis game, the controls are smooth and fluid, just like the animation. The graphics look really nice for 16-bit, and the levels are a perfect mix of challenging and fun. It's just a good game. I don't even mind the water level. I normally have a bone to pick about water levels, but this one is okay. The game never feels boring because they always throw something new at you. My favorite was the train level where you have to watch out for the tunnels and the signals. The level is very well laid out and it looks pretty good too. The later levels get pretty hard though, like the lava level. Oh man, that one was hard, but felt so rewarding to finish. Flintstones on Genesis, I can highly recommend. Check it out, man. The Super Nintendo game, The Treasure of Sierra Madrock, gets it even better. It takes all the good ideas from the Genesis game and expands on it. In this game, you have a board that you can roll dice on, and each space is a stage. Your idea is to get to the end of the board, but you don't have to do every single stage on the board. You also take a turn as Barney. I don't know why, but you could play this with two players, so that's got something to do with it, I guess. The difficulty varies a lot in these stages. Sometimes they're difficult as shit. Sometimes they're insultingly easy, but that does add a lot of variety to the game, and I ain't complaining. When you beat a stage, you earn a number depending on what number was on the timer, and if you get a row of them on this board, you get extra lives. You can get as much as seven extra lives by filling up this board. Sometimes you'll land on an enemy space and have to fight a mini-boss, and again, their difficulty can drastically vary. Sometimes Wilma or Betty will find you and move you to a random space. Bitch. There's also foot races you can do to get items in the game that make the game a little easier. Man, don't you love these Mode 7 graphics? I want to see somebody make a new racing game with graphics like this. There's also bonus games you can do, including Konami Simulator. <laughs> You laughed, don't lie. Again, this game is a banger. I can't believe how good these two games are. Give them a try when you get the chance. And that, my friends, is gonna do it for this episode. Now, there were a few more Flintstones games that came after, like a bowling game and a kart racer and an odd version of Burger Time, but I just wanted to do the games that were the most interesting to me, and I hope they were to you too. If you like this video, please do share it with other people because the algorithm doesn't do shit for me. I rely on word of mouth to get my views and if you really like what i do consider being a patron for one dollar you get your name on the board for five dollars you get to see the videos for anyone else and you get a discord server anyway that's gonna be it out of me today's folks i am Stuart k riley i'll see y'all Good grief. We're looking at a JoJo game. Now this is the part of the intro where I tell you what JoJo's Bizarre Adventure is, how popular it is, and the impact it had on the internet. But if you're watching this video, you already freaking know. You don't need me to tell you. If you do, well, 
you're gonna be lost as a goose this whole ass video, son. Now, a group of friends I hang out with started watching JoJo in a SciTube group, and only after one episode, I was hooked. The series lives up to the name, and I love everything about it. Even the English dub of the anime isn't that bad. I watched all of Part 3 in English and really loved Matt Mercer's take on Jotaro. Now, I knew there were JoJo video games, but most of them are fighting games, which aren't something I'm really into. I've got such bad short-term memory that I can't remember a bunch of button combinations, and I've got such bad short-term memory that I can't remember a bunch of button combinations. Quarter circle flick the stick alley-oop ACDCEFG screw that. So to me, it looked like there wouldn't be a JoJo game that would appeal to me. Like a platformer, an action RPG, something I could play. Even better if it was a retro game of some kind. And then I found out about the Super Famicom game. It's a JRPG. Okay, I can jive with that. And it's based on part three, my favorite part. I could already imagine it. Having all kinds of stand powers you can choose from in some turn-based combat, fighting all the classic characters, and then it all builds up to one big epic fight with Dio? Whoo, boy, I was ready to try this game. And I did. And did it do all that stuff? Well... Um. Oh, I'm sorry, guys. I recorded this in the wrong aspect ratio. There we go. All better. Now, this is not a joke. This is what the game looks like. And I know what you're thinking. Surely it doesn't look like this the whole game. Yes, the whole game looks like this. You get one itty-bitty little play field and data on each side. It's like playing a game in a Viewmaster. Remember them things? Well, as you can see, the intro of the game starts out at the start of part three, as it should. Joseph's trying to get Jotaro out of jail. Jotaro is like, fuck you, and Avdol is like, no, fuck you. Well, what's this outfit they got Avdol wearing? And why does he have green hair? And so next, the game takes us to an automated battle where we just sit back and watch and we get to see what the battle system looks like. Before you start a battle, you get to draw a card and it either gives you a buff or a nerf. And for some reason, Dio is just kind of hanging out. Hey, you want to hear what Aura Aura sounds like in this game? <laughs> 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 That's not Aura Aura, what is that? So Jotaro finally comes out of the jail cell. Joseph then explains to Jotaro why he came all the way up there to see him and why him and Jotaro all possess a stand. And it of course has to do with the resurrection of Dio and that it's the Joestar family's destiny to fight him. What is this sprite of Dio? It looks ridiculous. And now it's time to start the game proper. But before we do that, there's one thing I've got to do. We need to go ahead and get this out of the way because people will bring this up that I didn't do it if I don't. Let's get the meme out of the way. Happy? Okay. So you got a little bit of limited movement. You got left and right, up and down. And you've got this point and click thing where you can click on stuff and see if there's any items there. Most of the time there's not really. Not even in places you would think there would be items in, like this cabinet. Now when the game first starts off, it stays pretty faithful to the source material. There's the possessed nurse, the fight with Kakuin, and there's even an animation for when you pull out Kakuin's flesh bud that Dio used to control him. Don't move, Kakuin. If I fail, your brain is toast. Woo! And there you are. So this is a good time to talk about the battle system and what I consider to be such wasted potential. You would think as a JRPG, you would have a standard attack, like maybe Star Platinum throws a single punch, and then you would have stand powers that cost magic points so you can do classic attacks like Starfinger and Aura Aura. Well, that's how the battle system should have been. Here's what they've given you. They gave you two attacks just two, and they do random amounts of damage. I'm guessing there's a critical hit system in play, but I never found an English version of the manual. You have a basic attack that lowers hit points, and you have a talk attack. You can trash talk your opponent to death, and that lowers their magic point. Now, you would think that magic points would be how you do special attacks in this game, right? No. You want to know what magic points do? It's the same thing as health. That's right, you have two types of health, and if either one goes to zero, you die. So you've got one attack for HP, one attack for MP. What a stupid setup. It's like the developers had never seen a Final Fantasy game before. And then you have check. Let's talk about check. Some enemies will steadily dodge you every single hit or take little to no damage at all if you hit them. When that happens, you need to hit check. And you have a 50-50 shot of your character coming up with an idea. And on your next turn, you choose a tactic. In this case, the idea. And if your character is the one that knows how to defeat the enemy, an event will happen and they will hurt the enemy or even outright kill them. But notice I said 
if your character is the one that knows how to defeat the enemy. Only one of your party members knows how to defeat the enemy. And to find out, you have to have every one of them check. Hope they have an idea, which sometimes they won't, and you'll have to try to check again. Yeah, sometimes things that don't work in this game will work if you do it again. I can't name one off the top of my head, but it's happened. But anyway, you make them check again, hope they get an idea, then on the next turn, pick the idea and hope to God one of them triggers the event. Did I mention a check counts as a turn? So the whole time this is happening, your enemy isn't taking any hits and is getting a bunch of free hits on you. Plus, I still don't know how this works, but for some reason, the enemy gets multiple turns and can hit whoever they want twice if they want to. Maybe that was a way to balance out the fact you have up to six characters? I don't know, but it sucks. The battle system just plain sucks sucks in this game and it's totally unfair. I guess a bizarre adventure needed a bizarre battle system. And I know what you're saying, oh Stu, you're just saying that because you lost a bunch of times. Oh, uh, actually, I barely ever lost a battle in this game. The first half of this game is kind of easy after you figured the game out. I finally did die and oh boy did I after that, but we'll get to that. Now that I've taught you about the battle system, let's talk about the story. Now if you've watched a red part 3, you're gonna notice a lot of stuff. Stuff that's really wrong. In order to make this into a more streamlined game, I guess, there's only three locations in the whole game. Japan, India, and Cairo, Egypt. So they had to rewrite a metric fuck ton of the story to make all that work. But believe it or not, almost every stand user in part three is represented. You just meet them in completely different ways. Let me show you. Remember Tower of Grey, the bug stand the Crusaders fought on the airplane? Now you fight him at Jotaro's school, and his stand user is the school janitor. How about when you first meet Polderef? We all remember he was at the restaurant in Hong Kong. Well, now he works at a bookstore in Japan and he's blonde. We've got blonde Polderef. What the hell, dude? I guess he has aluminum chariot in this game. Remember the captain the Crusaders fought on the ship and his stand deep blue moon that was powerful in water? Well, you're not gonna believe how they handled him. There's this building you go in for no other reason than to fight stand users, and there's one particular room in the building that suddenly fills up with water, and that's the excuse they came up with to add the captain. Also, in this same building, you get to fight the monkey. And after you fight the monkey, you find a random TV inside this building that Joseph latches onto and Dio pops out of it and tells the gang to come to India. Yup, that's how that happened. In the game, at least. The airplane scene is in the game, though, but it's very different. The gang falls asleep, so they get sucked into the dream world of Death 13. And when you fight him, you can't use your stands. You have to use the idea function so Kakuin will yell to Jotaro to, quote, hit all of us. And somehow that makes your stands work again. But after you defeat Death 13, the fun's not over on the airplane, because after a quick piss in the bathroom, yes, you can take a piss in this game, and it actually gives you a stat boost of some kind. Then you fight the High Priestess. No real strategy to her, you just keep attacking her till she's dead. And after you beat her, Joseph, with his infinite wisdom of airplanes, flies the plane to safety. Yay! But yeah, the story is all over the place and all out of order, so if you're looking for an accurate representation of part three, this game ain't it. Now let's talk about some of the quirks of the game. The game tells you that there's a time limit. You have 50 days to defeat Dio or Holly will die. The days pass by as you travel from location to location. Progress through the story or rest at the Speedwagon Foundation, which is there to restore your health and save your game. But here's the thing, the game kind of lies to you. Once you get to the 50th day, time actually doesn't progress anymore, and the only thing that's different is you can't rest at the Foundation anymore. So technically, you don't actually have a time limit. Then there's the stats. If I was able to find an English version of the manual, I'd be able to tell you what some of these things do. But I have no idea. However, you can buy skill books that increase your stats. But since I don't know what they do, I don't know what to buff, and the game doesn't tell you what they do. Then there's the movement. Now you think you wouldn't get lost in such a small play area, but it's possible. And it happens almost at the start of the game. Now you can go through doors or alleyways by pressing up, that makes sense. But what the game doesn't tell you is there are certain areas you need to get to by pressing down. And it alerts you of this with a small white arrow that is really easy to overlook. I passed by an area I can go to numerous times without seeing the arrow. They should have made the arrow a little bigger. Maybe put some text on it? Something. Like some big text that says, Go here, you dumb fuck. 
Then there's the weapons and armor you can buy at the shop for everybody, and it's one of those games where a certain item only works on a certain person, and they don't tell you who it works on. You have to trial and error through the menus until you can pick it, selecting each character. It's really clunky. Now for some more story inaccuracies. Remember how Polnareff storms off to find the man with two right hands? Him and Avdol get in a fight, and Whole Horse shoots Avdol? Yeah, none of that happens. The whole gang fights Whole Horse and the mirror stand, realize they can't win, and run away. Then Polnareff is like, yo, sorry everybody, my bad for running off, we cool now. Then they fight Jay Guile in the desert and get a treasure key from him. Use the key to open a treasure chest which has a letter from Dio. Nothing really important, it's just Dio going, I'll get you Joseph Joestar next time. You find Darby in a bar and you play a card game with him. And it's the simplest card game in the world, you just need to get a higher number than Darby. You can actually win against him and he takes it very well. And he tells you where to go next. You don't fight him, he doesn't take your soul or nothing. Darby's a pretty nice guy in this game. Then you run around in this mansion where you fight Enyaba, and after you defeat her, she tells you that the lover's stand is inside Joseph's head, and at that point, Joseph says the line. Oh my god! Well, after you defeat it, you decide to go back and look for Whole Horse. So they go back to the mansion where they fought Enyaba, but instead of finding Whole Horse, they find Cameo and he fights you with his zombie clones. And you actually have to fight him three times for each wish that he grants. Then they find Cameo's stand user and he tells him that Whole Horse went to Egypt. Now you know as well as I do, this is not how they find Cameo's stand user, but I don't think what they did to him in the show could be put in a Super Nintendo game. If they did, that would have been fucking amazing. So Jotaro gets a camel and heads towards Egypt, but they notice the sun is really fucking hot and if you check the sun, you get to fight it. You are actually actually fighting the actual fucking sun. Then you find the sun stand user, I can't believe I'm saying that, and he gives you some money and says he was hired to find a dog, which of course is Iggy. Well, it turns out Iggy is hiding out in a temple, and while you're in there, you find Anubis's sword. Yeah, hopefully that won't become a problem later. And then you fight Iggy, who is pissed you found his hideout, and after some good old-fashioned animal abuse, Iggy becomes your friend. The gang's all here, boys. Then the Anubis sword gets stolen, it takes over some guy, you fight him and somebody else. You meet Zenyatta and Mandata would steal all your shit. Alessi turns everyone into kids. The less said about Alessi, the better. You get your shit back. Iggy runs off into the desert where he finds Endor. You fight him, then you make it to Cairo. Mariah magnetizes you. You follow her into a building where you fight her and Whole Horse. You find another TV and Dio tells you it's time to enter his mansion and fight him. But first, you gotta get past Pet Shop. And Pet Shop is one of the biggest badasses in the game. The game has been easy up to this point, but now Pet Shop is gonna skill check your ass. He does major amounts of damage to your team, and you'll steadily be having to heal to make up for it. It's a long, grueling battle, but eventually the bird will flip. At this point, this is where the difficulty bumps up a lot. The game is done fucking around. From here on, everyone you fight is gonna be a lot harder. Now I know what you're thinking. Well, I can just farm experience by doing a bunch of random encounters, right? There are no random encounters in this game. There's a set amount of enemies and once you beat them, that's all there is. That means you can't grind for experience points and make yourself stronger. You just have to do it. Anyway, you fight Darby's brother, then you fight Vanilla Ice. And the whole gang fights him at once and defeats him. Are you noticing something that's very wrong here? Something that's supposed to happen that hasn't happened yet? The entire team beat Vanilla Ice without anybody sustaining any major injuries of any kind. Yeah, that's what happened, right? Well, after you've beaten Vanilla Ice, you know what? time it is, it's Dio time, baby! Check out how they handled his time-stopping ability. Am I here? Or here? Or here? And now it's time to fight Dio, baby! And holy shit, they gave him a badass theme song! You gotta hear this! That's a theme song. That's been stuck in my head ever since I started doing this review. Hey, you want to hear what Muda Muda sounds like? Muda, 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 Muda. <laughs>
Anyway, the first time you fight him is scripted so you run away. Iggy finds a key to a strong box, and in that strong box is an item that'll make it to where Jotaro is very strong against Dio. So now at least Jotaro can fight Dio, but everybody else can't do shit to him. This fight is freaking impossible. I've seen people do it, but I genuinely think it's all up to luck and how many times your characters can randomly dodge his attacks. Because Dio attacks your character so many times, and he has enough power to one hit or two hit kill every single one of your characters. So you're steadily having to revive your party and do your best to keep Jotaro alive because he's the only one that can do any damage. This fight is so damn unfair. But you know what? It kind of fits the theme. Dio would be extremely overpowered. He would fight dirty and he does have the power to kill anyone in one hit. They actually did an accurate representation of if you really tried to fight Dio. A little too accurate. I honestly think if you win this fight, it was luck. According to walkthroughs I've found, he has a thousand HP, and each of Jotaro's punches does an average of 50 to 57 HP. So I would have to hit him an average of 20 times in order to take him down. And between my amount of health and revive items I have in my inventory, and the HP my party has, I can't keep my party alive long enough to make that happen. I kinda wonder if I've gotten this game in an unwinnable state. Like, because I didn't upgrade the stats of the characters with the skill books, because I didn't know what I was upgrading, and I used all my money to buy the health items, so I can't buy any skill books. I tried, oh boy, did I try, over and over again. But at this point, I have to admit defeat. I cannot for the life of me defeat Dio. Maybe if I had Darby's brother's stand that was really good at video games, I could beat him. But no. Because I'm out of time and out of ideas, we're gonna look up the rest of the game on YouTube. See if the ending of the game is actually worth all this headache. So Dio is defeated. The ground shakes a little bit. Dio and his ridiculous shoes lay down outside. The sun comes up and his body disintegrates. And then the gang all go back home. Joseph, Jotaro, Avdol, Kakuin, Polnareff, and Iggy. <laughs> the stand fucks off from Holly, and the credits roll. Whoo, boy. What a strange game. It's like the devs had no idea how an RPG works. This game, man, I swear, it really upset me. There was so much potential here. I just, I like the idea of a JoJo RPG, but every idea that was executed in this game was executed so wrong. And you know, I don't mind that the story was inaccurate to the real thing. I expect that out of a video game, but this whole thing could have been so much better. The whole thing of having this small ass play window, the fact that there's no random encounters so you can't grind, and the battle system is just a fucking mess. I can't recommend this this game. It upsets me at so many levels. And I was really hoping this game would be good because the other JoJo games are all fighting games and I'm not good at fighting games. So I hope that this would be a game for me. But no, it's not. This game has displeased me and I will never play it again. I feel like Joseph should have shoved Hermit Purple up the dev team's ass. Let's talk about the dev team. Who made this? Apparently it was a company called Winkysoft and all their games only ended up on the Japanese market. None of them came to the US. Well, that doesn't give me anything to go by. Anyway, that's JoJo on the SNES. If you want a good JoJo game, play All-Star Battle. Don't play this. Me, I'm still gonna be holding out for when they make an actual good JoJo RPG, or maybe a platformer, an action RPG, a hack and slash, something like that. Until then, I'm just gonna enjoy the anime. The English dub. Because I'm evil. Like Dio. And that's it for this one. If you like what you saw, consider becoming a patron. $5 will make you see the videos before anybody else does. And you also get a Discord and your name on the board. You can get your name on the board for just $1. Subscribing and the bell shit doesn't hurt either. But I can't make you do it. I'm not your daddy. Until next time, everybody. My name's Stuart K. Riley. This is Working Man Games, and I am out of here.
So a year ago, I made a video about Scooby-Doo games, and now it's my most viewed episode of Working Man Games. So I figured because there's still plenty of them I haven't reviewed yet, let's do it again. Now a lot has changed since I made that last episode. I have a better internet provider, which makes getting these games a little faster, and back then I had a crappy gaming laptop from 2016, so I couldn't emulate PS2 or PSP very well. But since then, I've built a PC, and now I can emulate damn near anything. Of course, I had to buy a GPU back Back when they were super expensive, that was a nice wallet drainer, but it's done. So now I can play the games I missed on the first review, starting with the Game Boy Advance games. Okay, my laptop wasn't that bad, I just didn't do the GBA games because I didn't want to, and now it's come back to haunt me. In the form of an isometric adventure game. My god, why are there so many isometric games on the GBA? Did some company like make some easy to program engine? Oh, who's this guy, one of the developers? And what? What are these character sprites? They look like the characters from Out of This World. So this game is based on the Scooby-Doo movie, so all the character portraits are the movie characters. Gotta make that movie tie-in game money, and who made it? THQ. First there was Ocean, then LJN, and then THQ. The holy trinity of bad movie game creators. So the game gives you missions, and it's all pick up this object, find this object, go here, go there, talk to this person. It's all very gripping and engaging. About as gripping as the grip you have on your dick while you're looking at E621 while listening to this video. That site ought to pay me for all the free advertisement I give them. So as you can imagine, there's this ghost haunting a hotel resort and the gang has to figure out who it is. You can switch out characters and they all have certain things that they can do. Like if you pick Velma, you can solve puzzles and unlock stuff. You can play this puzzle to unlock treasure chests which all have money in them. And the time I played this game, I only ever needed the money once. But I'm guessing later in the game you start needing it more. I guess the game is teaching us we really don't need to be worried that much about money. Join my Patreon. Do it, it'll be funny. So while going through this swimming pool room, I notice there's like five or six swimming pools in this place. Like, how many swimming pools do you need? Why not just have one big pool, not a whole bunch of little pools? Maybe it's so if too many people piss in the pool, we can all go to the other pool. I'm sorry, this pool thing bothers me. When we get to the basement, we encounter our first enemy in the game. Rats! Oh no, not rats! What are they gonna do, give me the plague? You can't fight them, so you have to sneak past them with the sneak mechanic. And then you got this one puzzle where the lights go off and you gotta hit all the switches to turn it back on. It's kinda like those ice puzzles in Undertale. Way to record your mouse cursor, by the way. These puzzles wouldn't be such a big deal if you didn't have to do them every five minutes. And then there was one of those pipe puzzles where you have to make the liquid flow through the pipe. How many games have this? And they boogered up the control controls for some reason. You would think you would press A to lay the pipe and it would give you another to place, but no, A and B rotate the pipe and you push select to deselect that pipe and place another one. This confused the shit out of me. You can't give my southern brain some shit like that and expect me to just roll with it. I'm already bad at these pipe puzzles and I was stuck on this for a while. Not because I suck at games, but, well, I suck at games, but that's beside the point. But yeah, it seemed like I would move two feet and I would have to solve one of these stupid puzzles again. I mean, the alternative isn't all that great anyway. I mean, I can do puzzles or I can run around an isometric GBA game. There's no winning here. Anyway, you find out somebody's misplaced their keys, you go to find the keys, you find Velma, you go get her glasses because she lost them again. Somebody said they saw the keys in the swimming pool. You find out you gotta drain the swimming pool to get the keys. You go to the basement, drain the swimming pool, do the puzzle. Don't get hit by the rats, go back to the first floor, talk to the woman, get the keys. Give the keys back to the person that Needs them. You ask a guy for info, he wants money, you give him the money, he gives you the info. He says you need a pass to go in the electrical room. You go to the hotel owner to get the pass, he says he's missing some blueprints. You go to the electrical room to find the blueprints. You talk to a wrestler that's got dirt on his clothes, Velma thinks that's suspicious. You find the blueprints, you find out how somebody's been playing with the lights. You find a guy that takes pictures of ghosts, he says he's missing his camera, you go and find the camera. You find all the clues, and then Velma says it's time to catch the ghost. You look for the ghost in the locked room, you have to do another damn puzzle. You go through the hallway, you gotta do the puzzle again. You go to the room where the ghost is, you have to do the puzzle again a third time. Fade out, fade in, you caught the ghost, and the wrestler guy. <sighs> Yeah, this game is something else, all right, but that something else ain't much good. I think I would have more fun playing Elden Ring, and I hate Elden Ring. Well, they made a second movie, so they had to make a second movie game. Scooby-Doo 2 Monsters Unleashed on the GBA. Well, this one's a platformer, and honestly, it didn't make me gag. I mean, it's not gonna win any awards, but I've played worse. 
For a licensed GBA game, this could have been way worse than it was. They gave Movie Daphne a sword, and you use it to chop up rats. Oh no, not rats. I promise I'm not gonna make that a catchphrase. Between each level, it tells you what happened in the movie, so you'll know what part you're theoretically in. And this game doesn't save, it has a password system. I guess a battery save would have costed too much money for this budget game. The boss battles are interesting in that even though the boss has a life bar, it's also got a number beside it which tells you how many hits it can take. Something else weird too, Scooby has an attack and it's running. But no, not the running you use for movement. You press B and you do a different run cycle and that's your attack. So you've got two different types of running? Attack running and running running? And when you hit the button, it takes a moment for it to work, so sometimes it doesn't work. However, to run run, you have to tap the control pad twice, which at first doesn't seem like a weird thing because a lot of the Kirby games do that. However, there's some jumps you have to do that you have to run and jump at the same time or you're not gonna make it. And they give you a gnat's ass hair worth of room to do that. It doesn't feel good when I have to prepare for each jump. At one point, this game randomly started throwing quick time events at me. I gotta press all these buttons to kill the Black Knight and you can't do it all in one go. You have to keep hitting him and knocking him out. Then it threw a level at me where I have to follow this old man without him seeing me. And it's basically that stage in Metal Gear 2 on the MSX where you have to follow the soldier. And it's about as fun. I hated this part. <laughs> at least they try to break it up and liven it up some by giving you obstacles and stuff. But then they pull this shit where there's doors that close and you won't make it unless you're directly right behind him. If I had to sum it up, I'd say this isn't a terrible game. I've played way worse. But this isn't something I would choose to play at any moment. But then there's Scooby-Doo and the Cyber Chase on GBA. This is the real deal. This is garbage. I mean, just listen to it. like a MIDI from an Angel Fire website. So you have this hub world where you have to pick up CDs so you can go to a level. The CDs are in plain sight, there's no enemies to fight, and it's just a completely straight room. And there's only three of them. And in one of them, as far as I know, the CD never spawns. What is even the point? The first level is on a jet ski, and you have to collect a certain number of Scooby Snacks and then get to the goal. The perspective's kind of confusing, kind of hard to tell how far or how close the Scooby Snacks are at. But it's not hard or anything. But man, it bores me to tears just looking at it. One thing you don't want to do is go to the level select without collecting any CDs because you can't exit back out of it. You gotta play a level. So you gotta play a level that you've already done. So I had to do the jet ski level twice. How hard would it have been to just program the B button to exit you back out of the level select? Also, I apparently have three Deadpools. The second level's a whole lot of nothing too. You just collect all the Scooby Snacks and then you go to the goal. And the level is basically as basic gets. There's no jumps, there's no platforms, there's no really anything to do but walk left or walk right and throw stuff at the monsters. This level feels like a game somebody made as a college assignment. And then there's the fight with the creeper, which, oh my god. You have to set off these catapults with slime on them. Okay, first off, slime. What is this, Nickelodeon? Anyway, the throwing angle of these freaking catapults is little to nothing. The boss almost needs to be standing on top top of it before it'll actually hit him. What kind of slime is it anyway? Is it that jiggly gelatin kind of slime or is it that runny diarrhea slime? All right, next level, snow chase. Wait a minute, this is the same thing as the jet ski level. It's just a snowmobile now. What kind of copy paste crap is this? Next level, and oh, it's the caveman. And I froze him in there. I guess they felt bad about making the levels really short and small. So they overcompensated like hell on this one. This level is gigantic and you have to find almost 150 Scooby Snacks to get to the goal. All the while I'm jumping on these trees and taking leaps of faith, moving around on platforms. I feel like I'm a monkey fucking a football here. And I finally did find enough Scooby Snacks to get to the goal, but guys, I have no earthly idea where the goal is. I ran around in this damn level for half an hour and I still never found the stupid goal. I gotta end the review about this one right here because I don't know where to go. But it's not like the game was going to get any better. Don't kid yourself. It wasn't. Then there's Scooby-Doo Mystery Mayhem on the GBA. 
Oh god, it's hitting the wrong notes. Wait, didn't I already play a game called Mystery Mayhem? Yeah, it's the one with that bad minecart level. So they apparently made two of them. Well, at least this one sticks to one genre. It's a platformer. But I'll be the first to tell you these levels make no sense. They're all set up like this big elaborate maze. Like who designed this building with all these platforms and stairs that go to nowhere and bookshelves just in random spots? It's like when a level designer makes a house. Like that damn Winchester house. This game has a Metroidvania thing going on in that it's all one big level and you unlock doors and secret passages to get to new places. But it's not the best example of one I've ever seen. No. The map makes absolutely no sense at all. You would think an AI generated these levels. The ghosts will hurt you unless you sneak past them, but normally there's a health pickup right there close to them, so it's actually faster to take the hit and get the health. I don't have very much to say about this game because I couldn't get very far. I had to find keys to open up doors and I never could find any of them keys, so I just ran around like a chicken with my head cut off. Two out of ten. Two for too damn confusing. Scooby-Doo Unmasked on the GBA. Now I played a game called Scooby-Doo Unmasked on the Xbox and I liked that game. And you know what? This game is good. It's real good. The levels are well laid out. The controls feel good. The graphics aren't terrible for GBA. This is all right. So basically they took the console game and made a 16-bit platformer out of it. And they did a good job at it. The costume mechanic from the other game is in here. And you get new moves and you can open new areas with it. Spiders, punch them. Sometimes in the levels you need to find a clue and the game will tell you when it's close by. And you need to find that clue. If you don't, you're playing the whole level all over again just to get it. And you really don't want to do that because for some reason, the levels are long in this game. I mean, they're really long. I mean, I don't mind because the game's good, but you'll go through section after section of the stage wondering, good lord, when does it end? You want a good example of how long this game is? Okay, I passed level two and I looked at my recorder and I'd already been recording an hour. The game throws you puzzles every now and again, and it's mostly just destroy the crate so you can move this crate. After you get through the levels, you have to go to Velma, and when you do, you have to select which clues you found are relevant to the case. After that, I had to play this level where I had to find trap pieces to help build Fred's trap. Now, what do you think that level entails doing? Did you say riding on a Mode 7 roller coaster? Yeah, this is like the minecart level in Super Mario RPG, but it's backwards. You have to avoid broken track, and you have to jump onto other pieces of track and stuff like that, and this is way better than the minecart level in Mr mayhem. I didn't mind this level at all. Then you solve a puzzle for Fred using button combinations, then it's boss time. The boss wasn't too hard either. You just had to punch the dragon in the face until he died. Dragons, punch him. Okay, I'll stop. That's not even my joke. Overall, good game. I was really surprised how good this was. So after you play Scooby-Doo Unmasked on console, go check out the handheld one. Scooby-Doo Classic Creep Capers on the Game Boy Color. I had this one as a kid and I beat it. It's not a bad game either. Mr. Hyde is stealing all the jewels, so the gang goes to Dr. Jekyll's house. So this game is kind of like a point and click game, but you don't do any pointing and clicking. When you get close to something you can interact with, you just press A to interact with it. You can play any character you want, and you need certain characters to do certain things. What's nice is you have a shared inventory between all of them. This game does not hold your hand, neither. It is really easy to get stuck and not know what you're supposed to do. Sometimes what you're supposed to do is just sit there and wait. A good example of what this game does to you is you need to be playing a specific character standing in a specific spot when the clock strikes 12. Only then will that cutscene happen. It really gets that cryptic. This game also has doors that are locked, but they're only locked for a specific amount of time. After you beat one of the chapters, the doors unlock. You don't need a key or anything. They just magically unlock. Trust me, if you don't have a walkthrough for this game, game, you're gonna be stuck. There's a lot of busy work in this game, too. Like, there's a part where you gotta keep putting suds in a washing machine to overflow it so the maid will have to leave her room to clean it up. Then you're supposed to steal something from her room. But after a while, she cleans it up and comes back. Then there's the light fixture puzzle. Ooh, let me tell you about the light fixture puzzle. So you have to get a stool with a missing leg and a sausage. You take the sausage and put it in the instant freezer and use the sausage as a leg for the stool, then you use the stool to open up the light fixture and use it again to grab the light. 
Now, the game is coded, so you have to remove every light fixture in this hallway before the last one finally gives you a fluorescent light to take. And every time you grab a light bulb, the sausage thaws out. So you have to go back to the freezer, freeze the sausage again, go back to a light fixture you haven't opened yet, and do this shit all over again. This really feels like they did this to pad out the game and make it longer, and it's the worst part of the game. Then there's this room with the doors that take you to the other doors. They're all connected together, but one door will take you to a secret room. Now you're supposed to go to somebody who's in the mansion that knows the pattern of the doors. But the pattern of the doors keeps changing, so it's actually faster for you to just kind of brute force it. All in all, it's not a bad game. It's just really hard to figure out without a walkthrough. But if you know how to play it, it's actually a pretty short game. You can get it done in less than an hour if you know how to play. So now we're getting to the 3D games, and now we're getting to the games that I wasn't able to review before. Well, here they are, starting with Scooby-Doo, Who's Watching Who on the PSP. A who's watching who, who's being true, and who don't even care anymore. It's a country song, don't worry about it. Now, the cutscenes still have this weird audio glitch going on, but for the most part, this game works. So basically, the story is there's this rival paranormal investigation team that's a parody of CSI, and the gang are joining them in a team TV show, and they have to solve the mystery before they do. Scooby helps us solve mysteries. A talking mystery solving dog could be a TV series. It is. It's called Goober and the Ghost Chasers. So the first thing that happens to me in this game is I get attacked by rats. Oh no, not rats. If I keep saying it over and over, eventually it's still not going to get any funnier. So the game gives you a hub world and three stages to go on. And before you can go to the stages, you got to collect enough Scooby Snacks to unlock them. The main goal is to collect clues, and there's a lot of clues you got to collect, and you just about have to collect all of them. There's three Three different types of stages. What you're seeing right now is the chase stage, where you have to run away from the monster. But the whole time, you need to be looking for the clues. If you miss one, you'll have to go back to the stage and get it later. But yeah, this is basically an obstacle course where you just keep going forward. It makes me think of Crash Bandicoot for some odd reason. Tana is goaded, by the way. Still can't hold a candle to Dixie, though. Then there's the driving stages. Yeah, driving stages in a Scooby-Doo game. When this game turned into Driver San Francisco. You know what? This needs driver music. <laughs> So in this driving stage, you chase after somebody and you try to pick up clues along the way. At the end, it tells you to ram them. I'm gonna ram them. And that's pretty much it for these stages. These stages in these games are pretty cut and dry. I can explain them in like 20 seconds. After you gather the clues, you give them to Velma and then you have to play little mini games because content. To accuse a suspect, you have to get six clues that are relevant to them, and some clues are relevant to more than one person, so it's up to you who to pin those clues on. But you still have to get three clues that are unique to one person. So that's three unique to one person, three that works on multiple people. You see why I say you might as well get every single clue. The third type of stage is a platforming stage. You run around looking for clues and getting your ass beat up by ghosts. The platforming stages are the most fun ones, and it makes you wonder why they didn't just make the whole game the platforming stages. Once you get a row of six clues, it's time to trap the ghost. And you go to this stage, which is insultingly easy. You just press a button when they get on the mark, and you do it three times. And that's pretty much all I have to say about the whole game. It's just the same thing all over again when you go to a new level. Collect tokens, platform stage, driving stage, chase stage, trap stage, rinse, repeat. The game's not bad. It just feels very copy-pasted. But for a PS SP game, it's all right. Next, we have Scooby-Doo and the Spooky Swamp on PlayStation 2. So in this game, you play two characters at once, and you can apparently play two-player co-op. And each character has got special things in the world that only they can interact with. Man, this really reminds me of the Simpsons game. It's got a lot of those same features. Are Scooby and Shaggy gonna munch on some steamed hams? So they find this voodoo lady that says she'll cook them something if they can find the ingredients for her. And as it turns out, the one they need first is somewhere where the gang was going anyway. Well, sure you can. Come take a ride to El Muncho in the Mystery Machine. Why does the audio sound so bad? It's PS2. Sounds like one of those Duke Nukem shit posts. Scooby Dooby Doo. And your mom makes two. 
So in my old video, I mentioned that one of the games I reviewed reminded me a lot of Devil May Cry, and we're gonna look at that one in a minute. But that game and this one seem to share the same engine and a lot of the same controls. This game's a little bit of everything. It's a beat-em-up, it's a platformer, it's got puzzles to solve. There's a lot going on in this game. But the best way I can describe this game is there's a little bit of everything, but a whole lot of nothing. There's a lot of instances where you're just kind of running from A to B with no enemies to fight or anything interesting going on, and the levels feel feel kind of empty at times. There's a collect-a-thon element in this game and that there's a bunch of extra things for you to pick up or do, like take pictures of ghosts or collect tokens from fallen enemies. You don't actually have to do any of this though, it's just for extra content. There's a lot of backtracking and going back to the same places you've already been before, which is the literal definition of backtracking. I'm, I'm tired, guys. But anyway, you'll be coming back to the same old locations over and over again in some cases. Sometimes the graphics take a a deep dive. Like, look at this guy's textures. Look how pixelated he is. PS2 games look better than this. That and the bad quality audio, I... I wonder. This game was also released on the DS. Could it be possible that they made the DS game first and then just converted it to PS2? That's like making a game on the PS1 and then putting it on the GameCube and not updating the graphics or anything, just straight up porting it. Yep, that was a thing. These enemies are annoying. They're like brides with dynamite bouquets? Whatever, game. Here's kind of an aggravating puzzle. You have to move these boxes around so you can move this pole. Pole. Pole, so Jaff- Javni? What is wrong with me today? Move the pole so Daphne can climb up it and jump off of it. Uh, let me try that again. Go up, go up, 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 up. Now jump. And go- I'm not doing this on purpose, I swear. Okay, climb up, jump up, grab the MacGuffin. Now, we didn't fall off this time. <clears throat> the controls don't feel good in this game at all. The jump mechanic feels stiff and your character floats suspended for a while when you jump all the way up. And the attack button feels like it doesn't want to work sometimes. Feels like your attacks aren't hitting when they clearly should be. This shit happened though and it made me laugh. I stood on top of this table and this one enemy just keeps circling around me. Look at him go. Poor guy, he's trying his best. I don't know, this game feels pretty unremarkable altogether. I'm struggling to even find things to say about it. It's like when your parents ask you, what did you do today? And you say, oh, nothing. What are you gonna tell them? I jerked off and played video games all day? When there's not much to say, there's just not much to say. I could say we play Simon to hack terminals, but who cares? And that's how I feel about this game. Who cares? I did at least go up to the first boss and that felt kind of underwhelming too. I mean, most of the time, I mean, your game is spent backtracking and pressing the same two buttons over and over again. The jump button and the attack button. And there's no really cool attacks, really. There's a charge attack that doesn't really work all that great. And then there's just your regular attack. The most I can say about this game is it's and game. That's my review. Last game, and we're doing a game I already did. Scooby-Doo First Frights on the PS2. Reason we're doing it again is because I could only get so far because I couldn't emulate PS2 very well, but now I can, so let's do it again. Both this game and the last game had a weird art style that I didn't know what to think of. It's not the worst Scooby art style I've ever seen. All these models have this uncanny dead look inside their eyes. Okay, I instantly like this game a lot better. There's something different about the controls. They feel a little bit more tight and fluid. I don't know what the fuck that means. I just know the controls feel better somehow. This is the game I said felt like Devil May Cry. I swear, if they put a score and a ranking system every time you fought bad guys, this would be the shit. I put Scooby-Doo and DMC5 into the AI art generator, and I got this. This looks badass. I think we have a thumbnail. The levels in general just feel better to play. There's a lot more emphasis on the beat-em-up part of the game, and I think it helps the gameplay immensely. This game is teetering on the edge of good. Also, interesting thing, there's a character in this game that's voiced by Cam Clark, Liquid Snake himself. Fred Jones, the star quarterback. Your spectacular pass really stole the game away from us, son. You enjoy all the killing. Pardon? Sometimes you'll unlock a secret costume for one of the characters and they'll wear it for the rest of the level. And you get different attacks with it too, like Fred can now throw footballs. Sometimes the action stops for a little bit and you have to look around for clues 
clues in the environment. And it took me a while to realize this, but a lot of them are hidden in breakable objects. So I ran around clueless until I looked up a walkthrough, but after I did, I was like, well, no shit, Sherlock, they're hidden. Sometimes the enemies will just sit there and not do anything. Will they fall asleep? I'm gonna do that after this video. So when you don't have beat-em-up arenas, you got some really nice platforming levels. So the game does throw you a little bit of variety. But the best part of this game is the first boss. He fucking sings. Well now look, here you are, and how lucky you're the stars. But it just might not end so well for you. Cause you'll be that mystery crew. You know I'll see my plans through. What I'm saying is no talent show for you. I don't know why they even put it on that day. You know what I say. Come now, skulls. That's your cue. Show these kids what you can do. This is hilarious. I love this. You want to hear the best part? When you hit him, he sings ow. Oh. <laughs> this is amazing. This is Cam Clark at his finest right here. And I would have gotten away with it if it weren't for you meddling kids. Ah, obligatory sewer level, I see. Oh my god, that's horrifying. Nothing Dante Doobie Doo can't handle, though. Not only are those dolls creepy, they make some fucked up noises. Ugh, I don't like that. I already don't like dolls or mannequins or anything like that. They don't have a soul! Oh, look, it's battle tanks. Oh my god, what is Velma wearing? Is that some kind of sumo wrestler fat suit? I don't know what to think about that. Nothing good. One odd thing I noticed is sometimes the idle sounds of the enemies will still play even though you're far away from them, but it acts like it's right there. It would have to be the doll, wouldn't it? Ugh. Anyway, that's about all I got for this game. It's not bad. It's nothing special, but it's still not bad. I would play it. And with that, I've reviewed every Scooby-Doo game. Well, except those PC ones, but they're really hard to get working on a modern computer, so I'm not gonna bother. So after playing every Scooby-Doo game, I have made up a top five. These are the good Scooby-Doo games. Number five, Scooby-Doo Classic Creep Capers on Game Boy Color. Number four, Scooby-Doo First Frights on PS2. Number three, Scooby-Doo Unmasked on Game Boy Advance. Number two, Scooby-Doo Unmasked on PS2, Xbox, and GameCube. And the number one is Scooby-Doo Night of a Hundred Frights on PS2, Xbox, and GameCube. The runner-up would be Scooby-Doo and Scrappy-Doo on the Amiga, because it's the only Scooby game, the only game in the world, where you can play as Scrappy-Doo. And that makes it awesome. Well, that's it, everybody. I hope you enjoyed the video. Speaking of Amigas, I just bought one. Does that mean another? Another Amiga episode? Uh, don't hold your breath, but maybe. But now I sleep. This is Working Man Games. I'm Stuart K. Riley. See y'all. Scooby, 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 well, you, we got some work to do now. Scooby, 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 well, you, we need some help from you now. The magnificent far off year of 2002. Really? Last video, we looked at a bunch of Flintstones games, and for the most part, video games were pretty kind to the series. I was surprised how many of them were good, so I thought we would double down on the Hanna-Barbera games and do the Jetsons. Now, the Jetsons I remember liking as a kid a little more than the Flintstones. I don't know why. I'm pretty neutral about both of them now, but either way, let's get this intro going. The Jetsons was yet another animated sitcom that ran on primetime just like the Flintstones and was pretty much meant to be the polar opposite opposite of the Flintstones taking place in the future. Contrary to the Harvey Birdman joke, it actually takes place in 2062, and recently George Jetson's birthday has been getting attention as canonically he was born in July 31st, 2022. So Tesla better hurry up and make some flying cars, damn it. The story of the Jetson show itself is strange. It had one season in 1962 and 63, and was cancelled after 24 episodes and re-ran on Saturdays, and for some reason, all the way in 1985, 22 years later, they brought the show back for two more seasons. By this time, George Jetson's voice actor, George O'Hanlon, had suffered a stroke and was blind and in a wheelchair. He had to have his lines recited to him one at a time in the vocal booth. And then there was the Jetsons movie in 1990, which you could make a whole movie about by itself, and three of the voice actors died before the movie was done. Man, what a cursed movie. But what we're worried about 
God is the games. And guys, I said the Jetsons was the polar opposite of the Flintstones. Well, it's that way with the games too. I hated every second I played all these games. So strap yourself in while we rip these games a new one. First, we've got an edutainment game, Ways with Words on the Intellivision. This was one of those weird games that required the keyboard attachment. So I doubt many people actually played this game. So the game gives you a word and then you have to spell out the word by finding all the letters on the road. And that's really it. The true definition of Babby game. I ran over the wrong letter just to see what would happen and well, it ruins your ears. Headphone check. <laughs> The real fun comes in where you can put in your own words. Oh, apparently you need at least four letters. Uh, NFT HD then. E621. Elden Ring sucks. Cause it does. They managed to fuck this up by not giving you a backspace, so Lycancock turned into Lincolncock. Lincolncock? Four score and seven inches? I kept trying to put your head explode, but I kept misspelling it and there wasn't enough room for it. Your head explode actually kind of sounds like an IntelliVoice. <laughs> There's a difficulty setting you can turn on where you have to guess what the word is, so then it becomes like Wheel of Fortune. But if I wanted to play Wheel of Fortune, I'd play fucking Wheel of Fortune. <laughs> After a while, the game starts throwing cars and robots at you to try to get you to hit them. So that gives you something to do, I guess. But the thing is, there's no way to lose. If you hit something, it just makes you stop for a moment and then you can go right back to it. There's no game over or nothing. What a pussy game. There's no way to lose, then it ain't really a game, is it? I would make the joke, in my day, we had games that you lost, but this is before my day. This is like the 80s. Either way, I only recommend this game if you're a wuss that hates losing. Next, we've got the Jetsons on the ZX Spectrum. Oh, I don't look forward to this. Yo, what's this about? And now some Polish words to my Drossel's favorite fucker? I found a Jetsons game that says fucker. Okay, so what's going on is what's called a crack tro. Used to, when people pirated games, they would put an intro on the beginning of the ROM. Sometimes add some words, some graphics, and some jazzy music, and even some cheat codes. Well, this is one of those. So now we have a Jetsons game that says fucker. This game's a fucker, all right, a motherfucker. This game puts you in a long, drawn-out maze and tells you you figure it out. Most of my time was spent going down holes. Man, if it ain't poles, it's holes. And then on one screen, there's an enemy that spawns right where you spawn. So you can't help but get hit by him. And what is it, a chair? I guess in the Jetsons universe, even the furniture tries to kill you. But yeah, the holes, some of the holes are put right where you spawn. Again, same problem. And they have a hitbox that's bigger than the hole itself. So you end up going through the hole even though you're trying to go around it. You have to be really careful and inch your way past the holes and hope to God the hitbox doesn't get you. Oh crap, here comes Mr. Spacely. How do I get past? Oh shit, I'm back at the start. So now I have to try to get past the holes again and get my way back over there. There's no alternate route either. I have to get past Mr. Spacely somehow. And I never figured it out. Not that I care, this game is terrible. You know what makes it even worse? You have a fucking time limit. So you have to somehow get through this whole stage in one fell swoop. And to that I say nay nay. Here's an insult you probably never heard before. This game is hot dog water. It's a byproduct of something that wasn't that good to begin with and holds no value to anybody. This game is hot dog water. Moving on. Next we have the Jetsons Cogswell caper on the NES. Spacely's rival Cogswell has set up a mining factory that could destroy the planet and Jetson is sent out there to take care of it. Your main attack is you can pick up and throw crates, kind of like Chippendale Rescue Rangers. You can throw them forward, you can throw them backward, you can even throw them up! <laughs> this game likes to play with gravity a lot. Sometimes you'll have to reverse gravity and walk upside down to get somewhere. There's a lot of really annoying enemies in the game like these gears. They jump too high to get past them, they don't jump high enough you can't walk under them. And then they hide robots inside the crates and they hit you instantly. In what universe is that fair? The platforms are real tricky in this game too. I thought I could make this jump, but the other platform moved away from me. Oh. 
Oh, of course the platform spawns after I die. And there's those gears again. Oh, God, they're so aggravating. These are the real gears of war. At least the first boss isn't too bad. You just throw blocks at him and he'll die eventually. You know that used to be a form of medieval execution? Throw rocks at somebody until they die. It was literally called getting stoned. I'm not making that up. Now we're on the second level and I can already tell you these bees are a problem. These bees suck my nuts a dees. Oh, come on. I thought that was a platform. You don't put something that looks like a platform and then it not be one. Mario doesn't have games. Let me try that again. Mario doesn't have platforms you go right through. Get on Mario's level or Mario's levels is level. I don't know. Then there's this spider boss you have to take out by throwing the blocks upwards. But the problem is you can't throw straight up. You throw diagonally up. So you have to throw it in an angle kind of to be able to hit him. Was it too much to ask to be able to throw straight up? This game makes me want to throw straight up. Holy shit, guys, it's the Ninja Baseball Batman. And man, are they a bitch to get past. Okay, what happened here? Oh, I see. I was just in the path of that bat. And if that wouldn't have got me, the ball would have. I was just doomed to die there. And I can't even get a chance to get ready to jump or anything. The stupid balls keep hitting me in the face. Probably wouldn't be the first time George Jetson's had trouble with balls in his face. Let's see. 250? You know what? Never mind. I don't want to see that. Hey, I found Astro and he's on the crazy thing. I can already tell you they got this wrong. That's supposed to say Rail River Rizzard Rorge. You know rain rucks my rocket, right? You know, Astro, I've never understood what you were saying. Right girls ruck rogs. Uh-oh. Later, I encountered this asshole who, when you throw blocks at him, he throws them back. You have to try to hit him from the back. Ah, oh, shit, I got gears trying to come after me, and I've got zero lives. I don't want to do this stage all over again. Oh, God. Oh, God. Oh, fuck. Oh, fuck me. They're right there. Holy shit. I am so fucking dead. Or not, I guess. Oh, my God. This boss is from hell. It jumps around all over the screen and shoots gears at you. Yeah, they're probably cogs, but if I say cogs over and over, it sounds like I'm saying cocks. He's not shooting cocks at me. And if that ain't bad enough, the game randomly reverses the gravity on you. Sometimes it reverses the gravity while he's right under me and then I get hit. I know this boss doesn't look like it's hard, but it really is. And every time it reverses the gravity, this text box appears and stops everything. And I swear, every time it does it, he's right under me. This boss is an insufferable pain in my gluteus maximus. That means giant ass. When I finally beat this boss, I started punching the air I was so happy. And now I get to go to Dreamland? Is Kirby there? Dreamland has this crap where you gotta go through a bunch of warps and you can only get to the end of the level if you've got the right combination to open up my heart. Let's see if anybody gets that reference. After that is the Blast Furnace, and oh god, this level sucks. It's one of those damn levels that goes dark and you have to turn it back light again. And it's got this one mini boss that shoots at you and you gotta try to throw the blocks at him, but you got blocks on a moving platform. And the platform ends up moving too far away from the platform you need to jump on. This section was god awful torment. Finally, I figured out what I had to do. I had to jump on the platform, grab the block, quickly jump back to the left platform, Platform, throw the block and then wait for the platforms to spawn again. Then I could kill the guy. Also, don't you love it when an NES starts slowing down because it can't take what's going on screen? Then, not long after all that, the game did that shit where if the camera moves up, then the bottom is considered a bottomless pit you die in. For real, this game can go fuck itself. Nobody else is gonna fuck it. Might catch an STD. An NES TD. Ah, uh, great. I gotta do all this in the dark. Well, thanks, game. That was a nice shortcut. And now I gotta hit switches to make lava go down while these Honda Asimo rejects shoot at me. Oh, I'm up shit creek with a turd for a paddle, and I can't cope a piss up a rope. Will you look at this? Will you look at what's going on right now? 31 flavors of death. 
But the thing that finally made me rage quit this game is this god-awful boss right here. You've got asteroids falling down. You've got this one jackass jumping around and also throwing stars at you. Now what this game expects you to do is grab the stars and throw them at the guy. But the way they screwed it all up was unless you grab the star in a pixel perfect spot, the star hurts you. Ain't that a bitch and a half? It's a bitch and a mini bitch. And that is where I said no more. You know what this game can go do? This game can sit in line in the DMV while the IRS and debt collectors are blowing up its phone and the landlord is telling it he's doubling its rate because he hates it. And it can sit in front of its computer while both its parents are staring right at the monitor watching everything it's doing. That's my personal hell for this game. This game? Oh! Oh my god! And you know what sucks the most? We still have two more. Give them to me, baby. Give them to me while I'm foaming at the mouth. Ooh, I hate it already. We got the Jetsons Robot Panic on Game Boy. Actually, you know what? Compared to the other stuff I've played, this one is actually the least bad. It's actually got some cool mechanics that the game plays around with. You play as each of the Jetsons family members, and each one has a special ability. Elroy's got a weapon. Judy Judy has magnetic boots that can walk over spikes, and Jane's got a rocket pack. And when you play the George levels, he's got all of them. It tries to do some clever things with puzzles and blocks, and for the most part, the level design is pretty decent. But notice I said for the most part. You see, the levels where you play as the other Jetsons are really short, so they compensated by making George's level longer, and it feels kind of like a slog to get through, especially since you move so slow. But what broke me from almost liking this game was one very specific thing. There's a part of George's level where there's acid flooding the entire level and you have to keep going up to get away from it. Well, there's this area that warps you somewhere and that somewhere is right above the acid and it's already up so high you can't hardly get away from it. And when you die, it respawns you right on top of the acid again. So you'll run out your lives until it's game over. That is so fucking dirty. Who decided that was a good idea? Well, I ran out of continues and had to start the whole game all over again. Or I would have had I not shut the game off. Who programs a level like that where you spawn on top of a death trap? A jackass, that's who. Ah, last game, The Jetsons Invasion of the Planet Pirates for Super Nintendo. Now, for some reason, this game has got a cutscene that goes on for five whole minutes. And all it is is some superhero tells George he has to stop a bunch of space pirates, which makes no sense. I mean, the guy's a superhero. That's like if Batman came up to some random person and said, hey, I need you to handle this Joker guy for me. And to do this, he gives George a vacuum cleaner, predating Luigi's use of a vacuum cleaner by several years. So you're supposed to use this vacuum to stick yourself to walls and ceilings and you can jump to new areas with it. And you can suck up enemies and shoot them too. It's a neat concept on paper, but then so was a movie player that plays games and that took a while to get right. For the most part, it has a lot of neat ideas and it makes you have to think outside the box to figure out how to progress. And I almost wanted to call this a good game, but then by the halfway point of the second level, the game started showing off its jank side. It did that same crap again where the bottom of the screen is instant death. That makes absolutely no sense. I just came from there. And it kept killing me over and over again. And it doesn't help that these gears move you around. This part was the worst. You have to unscrew these bolts that hurt you so you can have a clear path to climb the wall. But every time you jump up to it, the camera moves up just enough to where the floor is now theoretical lava. And if you're too close to the bottom, you die. It's a very unfair, janky death trap. For real, this level can suck a source filmmaker my little pony porn dick. And there was this part I was stuck on for I don't even remember how long, where this freaking wall keeps closing in and I have to hurry and climb up to the top and flip the switches to make it go back. The problem is the wall doesn't let you stick to it. You have to use the one on the left. If you could stick to the right,
right wall, this section would be a lot easier. Plus, it's hard to climb up quickly. You have to be really good with the timing on pressing the suck button, <laughs> the suck button, and the jump button in order to do it fast. And it's really hard to do. I can't really relate to you how hard this is to do. You would just have to play the game yourself, and I'm telling you not to. Then there were these sections where you had to keep walking to the right until a hole appears under you. And it seems to take forever to do it. There's like three of these in a row. What's even the point? They could have put enemies or power-ups, hearts, something that would have made these sections interesting. Also, do you like my score of 66660? Yo, what's the deal with this bird? Did I just get sucked into space? What a way to die. Safe to assume we need to go around these. Ugh, this boss. So you're steadily scrolling down and platforms are popping up and this robot keeps swinging its big round balls at you and you have limited vision. This boss is such a clusterfuck. You have to try to throw blocks at him, but if his ball isn't in the way, the platforms are. So it's really hard to get a clear shot at him. It's one of those boss fights that seems to go on forever because you're steadily waiting to get an opening and you can't quite get one it's just it's oh it's just bad you're gonna have to trust me on this fighting this boss was like having somebody pull your upper lip hair off one by one seeing this robot with its low hanging balls makes me think it has a pair of truck nuts but everybody should know by now a game is not truly a terrible platformer until it has a terrible water level and this one's got one in spades if it ain't the whales trying to suck you up it's the spiky thing Things that shoot shit at you. And it was this level that made me finally say, no more, fuck this, I am tired of these fucking games. I shut the game off, I will never play it again, and I am a better person for it. And that, my friends, is the Jetsons games, and as far as I know, that's the only ones that have ever come out. And maybe it should stay that way. I hope you all enjoyed this torturous review, and I hope to have more for you soon. Next time we're playing something I want to play, I'm tired of all these crap Happy games. Until then, I'm Stuart K. Riley. If you like what you see, subscribe and all that bullshit. You can become a patron for $5 or $1. $5 gets you a Discord server and your name on the board. And you see the videos before anybody else. This is Working Man Games, and have a good day. <laughs>